Hello, everybody, and welcome back. Well, Cody Rhodes is taking a rocky road to the finish of his story, and how many other people's stories are going to be finished when they go down with the SS Vince McMahon? It's the How Much Weirder Can This Get edition of the Jim Cornette Experience, and joining me, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host you. He'll furthermore be known simply as podcaster number one, the great Brian Last, everybody. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here once again. Apologies in advance to the listeners. I have a little bit of a cough today. I don't sound as vibrant as usual, but we've got a lot of interesting <laughs> things to talk about. <laughs> What's so funny? <laughs> right off the top of the bat here, you're going to describe your normal self as vibrant, your normal oral projection yes i in fact i am i don't have that sort of projection today i don't have the strength in my throat because of the cough to be as vibrant as or have my voice as vibrant as usual (sighs) it's it's like what what did they describe the baby at on as on seinfeld he's breathtaking breathtaking no you're not as breathtaking as you normally are like the other one where today they have the ugly baby and they're, uh, I mean, maybe that is the same one. They ask Kramer who he thinks the baby looks like. He says, Lyndon Johnson. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's an, <laughs> an ugly baby, ugly baby. Hey, but here, here's a banana for your monkey. Go back to the old borscht belt with that one. But anyway, oh boy, howdy. They won't give us, you know, we wanted to talk some about some January 1984 Mid-South wrestling and all kinds of wonderful stories of that nature but they will not let us rest because now the the wrestling world is in an uproar there's turmoil there's there's all kinds of k people's heads have caught on fire brian you know why because the rock has come in to layeth down the people's elbow and and some smacketh down and uh, uh, Apparently there's a backlash, but I I think I've got the new WWE 2024 theme song. I just don't know who's going to be singing it. I don't know if it's going to be Triple H or The Rock or Cody or even Vince. (laughs) They will never forget you till somebody new comes along. See, I can sing. I don't have a frog in my throat. Maybe you should apologize for your voice, too. Right here at the top of the show. Hey, 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 there's a new kid in town. But, uh... It, <laughs> Who's that? It doesn't really matter which side you're <laughs> on. Think about this. Think about this now. Is, is, is Cody singing it? There's a new kid in town because The Rock's got his match? Is Triple H singing it? Because The Rock's got the board of directors and the boss's ears? Is Vince McMahon singing it? Because at least on camera, The Rock, not off camera, he wasn't involved in any of that stuff. The Rock could be the newest, biggest heel in the WWE since Mr. McMahon for coming in and and people knowing that he can put his fucking foot down. But we're going to analyze all these things here on the program today. You know, normally I would say between now... Triple H and The Rock, I, you know, I would use one of my my cogent similes, Brian. I would use one of my old Southern sayings. I'd say, who's fucking this dog and who's holding its head? But maybe in light of recent revelations, maybe we can't apply those similes anymore here because it might be, who knows, it might be a future lawsuit coming up. Yeah, too close to reality with some of these people. Out of those four you, people, who do you think could sing the best? I think Cody probably has the best singing voice. Cody would probably be, yeah. Well, he's 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 younger, and he's probably, uh, you know, he hasn't got as much gravel in his voice. Vince could only sing if it was goddamn fucking Mom's Mabley's greatest hits at this point. But nevertheless, anyway, or Bob Dylan. We, you know, Bob Dylan started out, hey man, man. And now he's like, hey, my God, my. is it? Is he? What is he? What's happened to him there? Is it just age? Is he 80? What, 85 or whatever? He's in his 80s and his singing voice has changed. But also, I think whatever he was putting on to have the Dylan sound in the early years, he kind (laughs) of got away from that. 
Well, that's that's the, I guess that's what you always want to do is you get something that's internationally successful and remembered 50 years later and get the fuck away from it. I'm dropping shit all over the place back here. What's going on? You've got some issues today. You you you've already you talked about your voice. You were you were late on the uh on asked for more time on the recording process here. At least I got another hour of belly rubs and puppy playtime in with Harley. It was a family Family belly rubbing session here with Stace and Stace got on one side of her, I got on the other side, and we just rubbed the belly. She just grinned and just loved that. What was I talking about? It was your show. All righty then. Oh, so anyway, before we talk about all this chaos in, in wrestling, we wanted to check in with some of the listeners, the people, the cult of Cornet. That's who we want to check in with. And the first one is to say, I don't know if you are aware of this, Brian, but I just found out Rob Moore, our friend down in Texas, has been in the hospital, and he, he's been sick and under the weather, and we wanted to send him a, a shout-out that one of our mutual friends, uh, Travis Heckle, said he might make him feel better if we perked him up on the program here. So, Rob, get better soon so that you can send me another idea that people can threaten to sue me over. Get well, We're not going to tell the story again. Really nice guy. Really, really nice guy. Yeah, but until the lawyers come knocking on the door, Brian, and then it's, a, it's, a, it's all fun and games till people call the federal authorities. I can tell you something about Rob Moore that most people who know him may not know, or you may not know. In, I think, 1987, Rob started the Dingo Warrior Fan Club. Because <laughs> he was I'm based sure. in Dallas, and <laughs> I've seen the he signed did. permission slip. He didn't want people probably after a few years later to know that the way things all turned out in the end, but we love you, Rob. Get to feel better. Feel better. Um, and, and this is, I got this one from, from Kevin from Illyria, Ohio, that town that you had trouble pronouncing at one point, I had to rectify your stratagems there. Uh, but Kevin and his wife, Tommy, I get T O M I. Tommy, it's a, a female anglicization of Tommy. Um, they lost their Jack Russell and Shih Tzu mix, or as they like to call him, the Jack Shit. His name was Jax, J-A-X. So you see where all that's going on in there. Uh, but he was 12, he had heart issues and et cetera. And, but the vet... This time last year only gave him a few weeks to live, but he just passed away just a, a couple of weeks ago. Missed his 13th birthday by six days, and we just wanted to send our sympathies to Jack and Tommy. Not an official Reggie's Corner. We'll catch up on that at some point, whenever people in the business stop killing their own careers. And also, uh, Brian, here is the... I got an email from Darcy... From Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada, one of my favorite places in the whole wide world. And I'm going to read you something, but then he asked a question, and I want to get your input on this question first before I answer it, okay? But he says, um, in the summer of 2020, my twin brother Dale faced a devastating diagnosis of brain cancer. He had been a dedicated fan of your podcast for quite some time, and during the grueling periods of two surgeries and numerous treatments, your podcast provided much-needed distractions and laughter. And sadly, Dale passed away in November of 2022. And Darcy, we're sorry to hear about that, but Darcy goes on to continue. I once asked him what question he would have loved to ask you, Jim, and I'm now posing it in his honor. In the spring of 1994... Dale and I attended a WWF live event in Sydney, Nova Scotia. That night featured matches such as Jeff Jarrett versus Doink, Razor Ramon challenging Diesel for the Intercontinental title, and a main event grudge match between Lex Luger and Crush. Here's the question, Brian. Sitting ringside in the front row, first row, was someone who bore a striking resemblance to you, Jim. If it wasn't you, then it must have been your doppelganger. Assuming it was you, 
Could you please shed some light on your role in the WWF during that time? This is Nova Thank Scotia, you. you said? Sydney, Nova Scotia, a house show in the front row. Would you t- please handle this one for me? In the spring of 94, Dick Murdoch came to Smoky Mountain Wrestling, so I don't think Jim was in Nova Scotia for a house show. <laughs> I mean, no. you, you every now and then... Did you do any house shows in 94? I mean, I was trying to think maybe the garden, but did you do any no, house I, shows? No, I think I did. I did do the garden, I think, in 94. And actually, no, maybe I didn't as a house show because the 94, the garden was like in January. They were going to have their own Royal Rumble, and that's when me and yeah, the bodies right. got snowed in in Knoxville. We got all that fucking snow. And I, I actually had said, fuck it, I'm going home while I can still get there before they officially called the flight off because I wasn't going to take off in that weather. But the boys, Tom and Jimmy, they waited until, because it was their Madison Square Garden debut, right? So they're like, hi, well, not debut, but it was a big deal to them at the time. But nevertheless, I've, I'm just, I'm fucking with you, Darcy, because no, I, if I was at a house show, it wasn't in Sydney, Nova Scotia, because I still was mostly in Smoky Mountain Wrestling. I was just doing television and pay-per-view events for the most part with the WWF, but also I wouldn't have been sitting in the front row. Yeah, that's the other interesting I, thing, yeah. Yeah, I, was, I still wasn't. A, they didn't have, a, you know, like goddamn people, the fans at that point, you couldn't guarantee that the people in the front row were with it and weren't going to just fucking dump goddamn popcorn over your head or Pepsis or whatever or kick you in the shins and shit. No. Um, yeah, that's the thing. It's not like you would have showed up and said, who am I working with? Am I going to the ring with Yoko tonight? No, no, no. Just sit at ringside. Yeah, we got a front row ticket for you. We couldn't sell. (laughs) So just watch everything. No, it, it, that's no, it was not part of some type of subterfuge or anything. That wasn't me, but now who the fuck, because if, if it, if it looked like me, he had to be almost same age as me. So it couldn't be like some, and also I've never been to. Sydney, Nova Scotia, in that in that way, or any way, actually, come to think of it. So there you go. We did go to Halifax that time that I tried to fucking pull Bucky Beaver's teeth out, but uh, but no. But anyway, that was just I I, I was amused by here. The thing is, Darcy, you got you had one you had one shot at asking a question. Could have been. Who knows what it was the meaning of life, Jim? See, I could have filled you in on that, but now nobody's going to know because you didn't think to ask it. I'm just not going to tell you. Anyway. I like the idea that some guy with glasses sitting at ringside and people are like, hey, is that Jim Cornette? Well, also, he was carrying a tennis racket and wearing a pink suit, but <laughs> no, I, 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 I kid, I Josh. Uh, we got a nice email from Nick in Sycamore, Illinois. Would you like to hear this? This is actually a, yeah. a nice thing that we're not going to make fun of for once. Nick says, my son Avery is an 11-year-old who was diagnosed with nonverbal autism at age two. He also struggles with a sensory processing disorder, so finding things that he can tolerate, especially orally, as in audio-wise, can be a struggle to say the least. Like some youngsters do, he and I have found a bond over the spectacle that is professional wrestling. The overall presentation and production of the television shows provide the right amount of stimulation to keep his attention, and this is rare because the typical time he'll dedicate his attention to anything is five minutes on a good day. I write all this to tell you that about two years ago I was listening to some older YouTube clips of your promos with the Midnight Express and found him being drawn to the screen. Of course, with him being unable to share his thoughts verbally, I had to look for his cues to derive his enjoyment from said promos. Fast forward to present day, and one of his favorite activities is to drag me by the arm to the car so I can put on the latest episode of the drive-thru or experience, which he will listen to for hours at a time while we aimlessly cruise the Chicago suburbs, and I could not be happier. Uh, Finding ways to bond with him is not always easy, but you have provided us with a fantastic, albeit vulgar at times, opportunity to smile together. And uh, thank you, Nick, for letting us know that. And and that's the thing is, (laughs) 
Brian, what would you, what would have been the odds? I mean, it could be classical music or it could be sounds of nature. Your voice and my voice. What the fuck is going on? That's a very nice story. You know, we hear somewhat often from people who will say like they ride around with someone or someone in their family listens to the show. They don't even like wrestling. They just enjoy the show. They enjoy hearing your stories. Yeah, I don't know if, if uh, I think Nick is probably sounds like a father who's tried a variety of, of activities. And I'm just I, I apologize to Nick at the same time as I'm glad for him that it, just, it has to be you and me. Oh, Lord. Anyway, and, and speaking, by the way, we've been talking about all the news in the WWE. Well, I've got some customer feedback here. On uh, some of the WWE business, and also... Their customers? Well, you have one of theirs and one of mine. Both these things can be true at the same time, remember? No, from Ryan. He doesn't... Uh, well, he mentions here where he's from, but uh, kind of. But anyway, I will read it and you'll understand. Ryan says, Dear Jim, I just wanted to say thanks for not sending my purchases to the Republic of Congo. Right before the holidays, I ordered two shirts from your store, of course, Cornette's Collectibles, folks, at jimcornette.com, and two from the WWE store. I received my shirts from your store in early January, which I would consider really fast when you take into account the holidays. Thank you to the fine feather bottoms. But the WWE shop zone, on the other hand, took forever. I was perplexed on why it took so long, so I checked up on it. At this point, I noticed the package was sent from New York to Belgium, Whoa. where it was awaiting to be sent to its next location. From there, I took a closer look and realized they were sending it to the city of Fargo in the Republic of Congo, which I don't believe exists. So after two phone calls and a few days of waiting, I was able to receive a refund for the CM Punk shirt they were now sold out of and expedited shipping of the other. So I just wanted to say thanks for the fast shipping and not sending my goods to the Congo. Fargo in the Congo. Fargo in the Congo. <laughs> or Mogo on the Gogo, -go, whatever that old vaudeville routine was. Um, well, right there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. There's some consumer product information, feedback, whatever the fuck you might call it from the people at the, I am more efficient here at jimcornett.com at Cornett's Collectibles, more efficient than the evil empire at wwe.com. So uh, choose for your, who do you want to support? The people who are paying out hush money or the people like me who are just frying up some hush puppies here at home minding our own business. All the hush money, then they send your stuff to the Congo. Yes, and it, they're probably laundering it over there. That's part of some kind of scheme. How would that work? You're the financial genius. They, they take money for goods. They send the goods to the Congo. They melt them down and send them back and sell them again. What's going on there? They send them to the Congo. They declared it to be lost mail. They then have a person on hand in the Congo on their behalf to sell everything on a bootleg site. There you go. And they're, they're making their money twice. And they're not even using corny coin. Well, you don't need to worry about that, folks, at jimcornett.com. And by the way, I'll go ahead and tell them now so we can get on to the good stuff. What they're looking forward to, it's not even a week away. Saturday, February 10th at noon Eastern at jimcornett.com. As we mentioned, the part two, the final chapter of the Midnight Express 40th anniversary celebration will be the tag team sets for the first time ever. Eaton and Condry or Eaton and Lane in display boxes, heavily illustrated with full color photos. And each action figure set comes with an autographed photo of either myself and Stan or myself and Dennis. A very few packages with Bobby's signature, as we've talked about. That's why you got to be on there at noon. And I've impressed upon Hotchkiss that he needs to make that live right then, that very second. And, you know, Hotchkiss it has a hard time counting to 12, but he's going to wait till the hand is right there. Anyway, 
These can only be purchased at jimcornett.com. They are available nowhere else in the world. There's less than a 1,000 of each of the Midnight Express sets, and there's 500 sets of Stan Lane and Dr. Tom Pritchard, the Heavenly Bodies for Good Measure, along with an autographed photo of all three of us and with the Smoky Mountain Tag Team Championship belts. And as I've mentioned, because I'm getting too old for this, none of these are going to be remade or others produced in the future. This uh, the uh, About 500 of the four packs are still available if you want to be a completist. And that's going to be the big celebration that we, we finally did the action figures. And I'm, I'm doing a George Costanza and bowing out on a strong note. Uh, but uh, anyway, thank you to everybody, by the way, who has or will participate. Because again, um, the Midnight is sharing equally and Bobby's kids and grandkids and the proceeds from this. And it is meant in various ways to each one of the, the entities, Dennis and Teresa, Stan and Maria, and Stan's mother, and all of Bobby's progeny, it's, it's meant a lot so far. Saturday, February 10th at noon Eastern. Did I say that, Brian? But you can go right now to jimcornett.com and look at the various merchandise and pictures of same and, and see the some come with books and some come with Bells and whistles and what is it in in Whoville? The flim flangs and knickknacks. We've got all kinds of packages for all, but starting at ninety nine ninety five. Now I sound like fucking Wayne over at Classy Motors, and it's got cool air. What do you want to talk about? Tat on telly <laughs> That's how I feel. Folks, if I could only reveal just how miserable Brian Last has been for the past couple of days, but... And it's not even because of The Rock. No, it, it was not even because of something somebody else did. It's some insidious, cretinous bug inside your system. Uh, but nevertheless, um, well, you have some information, because before we just talk about the WWE, which is now, <laughs> for good or bad... It's like they're hogging all the spotlight for poor Tony. Tony had his, you know, minor meltdown on Twitter last month or whatever, and Jericho got in a little trouble, and then suddenly the WWE comes in with fucking steamrollers and dump trucks full of good news and bad news. We're going to hit you all with it. Bam, 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 bam. And they've just knocked everybody off the front page, just taking all the oxygen out of the room. But the one thing that we have not talked about in AEW was the ratings for last Wednesday night's Dynamite program. We reviewed it on your show, The Drive Through, but we had we, that was so quickly after the fact that the ratings people hadn't even caught up with us yet. And we continue to marvel every week that anybody watches this thing at this point and, and that they're narrow casting to such a minute niche audience. Uh, but where'd they start and where'd they finish and what happened to Mr. In Between, Brian? What date was this even? Seems like a century ago. It was a month ago or last month, January 31st, 2024. Well, that's what's happened. It's a month has gone by. Or a few days, it was last month, not necessarily a month ago, I misspoke, but AEW Dynamite. Well, it was the... last month. It was last it's, month, but not a it month was ago. January 31st. Well, it's February now. Well, on the 31st. It was a month ago, because January is a month before February. From 8 to 10.06 p.m. on the 31st, AEW Dynamite did 818,000 viewers. Well, I've lost my pen now here. Hold on. I got to keep track of this. I want to make sure I know exactly what's going on. 818,000. So they lost about 15,000 of their faithfuls. And you have to say here at the top, with everything happening in WWE, like you said, it's easy for that to just swallow up all the wrestling news and everything. Before that, you had Tony's meltdown, you had Jericho's stupidity. But there's no buzz. There's no buzz about anything with AEW right now. It's kind of... Not concerning, but it's amazing. There's no buzz it, well, about anything it, there. It, it's a sound. It's not really a buzz. It's more like a beep, beep, beep. Well, let's see where the uh, heartbeat started. Beep, beep. Well, hold on. They didn't fall oh, on yet, sir. Oh, and by the way, I, I read in some, one of the industry publications, 
I can remember, of course, I peruse all the finest uh, uh, documentation in the world today on the ratings, but it, uh, the Big Bang Theory is doing about 1.2 million people or thereabouts a lot of times. That uh, before, in the time slot before uh, AEW. So they're they're being handed more often than not, even more people than their opening quarter reflects. It's just those people are the ones who go, oh, fuck no, and they're gone like that. But go ahead. Well, let's go to quarter one, 8 to 8.15 p.m. These were compiled by WrestleNomics. The last minute of the Big Bang Theory, I'm going to put that in there because that is the first <laughs> thing that you see when you tune in at 8 o'clock, followed by John Moxley versus Jeff Hardy with picture in picture, 981,000 viewers. Okay, so they're, they're, they're up there, almost a million. Lately, they've been getting right at about a million people to start. Well, quarter two, 8.15, 8.30 p.m., the continuation of Moxley versus Hardy, Ooh. the post-match with Mystico, Hechichero. What, what? Now, wait, what? I'm not terribly familiar with him, to be honest Hector with you. Hector Guerrero? Is it what you said? Hechichero, I think is how you pronounce it, or Hechicero? H e c h i c e r o, c c c rider. I don't know. Well, him, Mascara Dorado, Volador Jr., Matt Seidel, Matt Menard, Angelo Parker, and Christopher Daniels, and a partridge in a pear tree. Followed by an ad break, and the beginning of Adam Page versus Toa Leon, uh, Lenoa. <laughs> Linoleum? Is the, his name is Total, <laughs> total, total Linoleum. Total. <laughs> well, it's Toa Linoa. Uh, I keep thinking of Tay Leone because of you. 836,000 viewers. Oh, sweet Jesus, as Percy Pringle would say. So right there went 145,000 people, which one might be able to attribute to Moxley and Hardy. Uh, going through that quarter hour milestone. Continue on. The milestones continue. Quarter three, <laughs> 830, 830 to 845 p.m. The continuation of Page versus Linoleum with picture and picture <laughs> ads and the Young Bucks backstage angle, 799,000 viewers. Oh! Jeez, so there went another 37, but... Uh, <sighs> Is that the first time you can remember they've gone below 800,000 in the first quarter or first, uh, hour? first hour? You know, I, I can't remember the last time it happened. I'm sure it has, but maybe the first time in a while. Youch. All righty. Well, quarter four, 8.45 to 9 p.m., Wardlow versus Commander, the post-match with the Undisputed Kingdom, Orange Cassidy, Trent Beretta, and Rocky Romero, an ad break, and the sit-down interview with Big Bill, Ricky Starks, Sting, and Darby Allen, 798,000 viewers. Okay, so I was going to say, well, maybe they just saw the, the buckaroos, Matthew and Nicholas, in the previous quarter and said, fuck, it would come back. But no, they, they didn't even come back for Darby Allen and Sting here. Well, we next have the big 9 o'clock hour, 9 to 9.15 p.m., quarter 5. Chris Jericho versus Kyle Fletcher with picture and picture ads, 786,000 viewers. Ouch! And they put Jericho on, even if it was Kyle Felcher. Jericho is the only thing, well, one of the only things they have passing for a name. And they put him at the top of nine o'clock hour in a match and lose 12,000 people. That's not a good sign either. He's been off WWE TV for a long time at this point, and they haven't really been doing anything good with him in ever. So uh, not a big surprise there, but quarter six, 9.15 to 9.30 p.m., the continuation of Jericho versus Fletcher, the Deanna Perrazzo video, and the acclaimed Billy Gunn, Bullet Club Gold Live promo, an ad break, <laughs> and the start of Taya Valkyrie versus Deanna Perrazzo. 795,000 viewers. Oh, good Lord. The fucking potpourri segment gained over Jericho at the top of the hour. That's uh, interesting. Hey. Hey, what? What was that, Fonzie? I, 
No, I'm just, hey, <laughs> hey, hey, yeah. Hey. They got 9,000. Cunningham, in my office. Hey, no, come on. Well, we go down a quarter, what is this now? Quarter seven. I don't know, Tom Bosley, you tell me. 9.30, they sit on a potsy. 9.30 to 9.45 p.m. The continuation of Taya Valkyrie versus Deanna Perrazzo. I'm laughing because I'm fucking happy day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> With picture and picture it's, ads. You look more like Anson Williams. So. A post-match and the Darby Allen Young Bucks backstage confrontation. Another ad break and the Samoa Joe entrance. Hold on, wait a minute. The Buckaroos were in this quarter too. I'm going to say this is going to be the lowest quarter in the show so far. And you would be correct, 759,000 viewers. Ouch! Oh, boy. So they have, just by random chance, they in quarters three and seven, they have been in the lowest quarter hour of the program to that point in time that that appearance took place. Yeah, again, it's a harsh reality that a lot of people who love the Bucks and have for a long time have to face about who they are in 2024. Well, they're, they're doing such important and excellent work, and they're saying such profound things in these backstage pre-tapes that they phone in for their seven figures a year from Richie Rich. CM Punk will generate more income for WWE over the next nine months that he's injured than they will in AEW. Think about that. <laughs> We go now to quarter eight, and I remind you, we have an overrun. Can, can we hurt both of them, see if they can make it a contest? <laughs> we have the Adam Page backstage promo and the beginning of Rob Van Dam versus Swerve Strickland with picture in picture. 792,000 viewers and the six-minute overrun, the continuation of the match and then Adam Page confronting Swerve, 820,000 viewers. Okay, and, you know, again, do we take that at the end out like we usually do? Because what the fuck? Uh, but at least it shows some. there was some curiosity, not only for who the opponent was going to be, and it's Van Damme, and he's a legend, but also Swerve is now... He's their biggest you know, star. The, he's the one that, that moves some kind of rating, especially toward the end of the program. If they put anybody else, they just... The plummet off the precipice. The plummet off the precipice. Well, if you take out the first quarter and the overrun, the key demo peaks with Swerve versus Rob Van Dam in quarter eight with 348,000. It's 393 for the first quarter, but that's Big Bang Theory, so I'm not counting that. It bottomed out for the nine o'clock hour, 311,000 for Jericho versus Fletcher. Well, you know, if you take out the the first quarter and you take out the overrun, you also, you start with 836,000 and you end with 792,000. And the lowest you went the whole time was 759. So really, of the real fans they have probably watching this program, or usually most of their programs, it's around 75,000 that they have a range there of 750 to 830 or whatever. Yeah, it's like 800,000 people and every week who are looking forward to Dynamite and give it a chance. And they come in and they go out and who knows where they are, but it's around that number. It's not the 900,000, yeah. 1 million number that the Big Bang Theory gets. It's about 800,000. And, you know, then on, on some memorable occasions, they, they plummet even further at the end from that when they've had these real stinkers. But, the base people, they're, they're trying to give it a chance, but you can tell where even they zone out in the middle or toward the end. And other than you know, Swerve, it, it, this week it just happened to be around the buckaroos. Listen, other than Swerve, who has always moved numbers uh, for the most part, and people are into, and he seems like he has something going on, and that picked up at the end of the show, Moxley versus Jeff Hardy, the women's stuff, Page versus Toa Leone, or whatever his name was. Linoleum. The Wardlow Commander match, the Orange Cassidy crew being involved in stuff, Jericho versus Fletcher. There's nothing on the show to excite anyone. I'm not sure I get diehard AEW fan, like the most diehard. These are bad shows. These are bad lineups and bad shows. Well, you know, we've just, we've talked about it. They've kind of run out of stuff besides Tony's you know, incessant matchmaking, which just writing down matches and dream matches and 
oh, we can't wait to see this guy that has never wrestled here before come in and wrestle of the same fucking match that the last five guys that came in have never wrestled here before had. Because nobody knows who the fuck they are and we can't tell the difference. Well, they have a big show this Wednesday. Big uh, crowd expected in Arizona. Tony Khan has a major announcement. Some big matches. Swerve versus Adam Page. So I expect this week's number has to be significantly up, but we'll see. Well, we'll, we'll see what the, uh, what's going to happen with Page. Okay, besides the fact that he drank Swerve's blood, Swerve is beating him every time. But does anybody want to see Page win this and get a title match with Samoa Joe instead of Swerve? Does anybody want to see a three-way with Page involved to get in the way and be a fucking distraction and a third wheel? Does anyone and, truly see Adam Page as a main eventer and not just an upper mid-card guy? And that's not an insult. That's the reality of who he is. And so, you know, but Tony hates dirty anybody's feelings, so we'll we'll find out about that. But, you know, he's coming off the drubbing of the 300,000 people who watched Collision on his national cable network. And, you know, he does the same number on Wednesday nights, give or take. And there's nobody buying tickets to the live events except for the guy that's going to retire. So he won't be there to sell tickets to the rematch. So if I was Tony, I would, I would be looking for something to do. By the, and by the way, I'd like to say, since we're talking about numbers, Brian, just if I could, just for a second, if I can toot my own horn. Well, this closest it's I had, really a but, toot, but okay. Um, we want to thank everybody out there. This was the same week, calendar week here. We hit four hundred thousand subscribers on the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel and five hundred million downloads. Views. Million views or views or whatever the fuck, however the what is whatever the terminology is, five hundred million of those in the same week. That that ain't bad. But wait a minute, we're doing audio. How can they be views on the audio? The Travis Eckle artwork. They find guest artists that we have on the channel. Everyone loves that stuff. Well, that's true. They're just listening to us in the background where they're staring into those for the fucking meaning of life that's hidden down deep in the fucking duck's ass or whatever. Maybe. Those pieces of art, those are 4K. So people blow them up on their screen when they listen to the show and it looks great. Well, there you go. They're, they're 4K. Well, they're for you, for you to look at. That's even better than being 4K, but it's not as good as being for me. <laughs> but right. anyway, here's the thing. While, while, while Tony's numbers are sinking and our numbers are growing exponentially every goddamn day, I got an idea for how Tony could up his numbers. Because if Tony could up his, you people out there, you could up yours. I've got the idea. <laughs> well, would you like me to? Would you like me to explain it to you? What? What are you laughing already? I haven't even told you yet. You, well, you already told the listeners up yours. So I want to hear what's next. Well, I want them to up theirs, because everybody. See, here's the thing. Here's what Tony needs to do because his numbers are are kind of bad because the only numbers he's getting credit for on TV are the people that's actually watching his show, right? What he needs to do is he needs to get him an ExpressVPN account because then ExpressVPN is going to scramble it to where people, people are trying to watch the USA Network. They're going to be directed to Tony's show. And the people that are trying to watch the Food Network, they're going to be directed over to TBS or TNT. And the people that are trying to watch C-SPAN, if Tony gets the express VPN and they scramble all these signals so that then nobody knows that they're actually watching AEW wrestling on purpose, he'll get a bunch more fucking viewers. Isn't that brilliant? I don't think any of that can happen. Certainly isn't brilliant. What? I mean, it's an inspired idea. I'll give you that. Well, inspired is even better than brilliant. A lot of people around here are brilliant, but very few are inspired. You got me there. <laughs> well, see, there you go. But it, there's the thing, because ExpressVPN will scramble everybody's fucking brains so they don't know how to think about you. You won't be where that they think you are. You'll be somewhere else, and they won't know. Because that way, they can't track you, because they is everywhere, folks. We've talked before about the people inside your walls that the 
internet service providers plant there to eavesdrop on you. They've got the stethoscope. The things are sticking in their ears, and they got the round thing up on the other side of the wall while you're talking to fucking Junior about his goddamn grades. So imagine what they think when you're in the bed with the missus with nookie time later that night. What are you talking about? Imagine what Junior thinks when he's got the... if you, you've taken the glass and turned it upside the other way to listen. Nevertheless. No, I haven't. ExpressVPN will scramble all your shit where that all those days, and you know who they are, can't keep track of what you're doing on the internet. And they can't harvest your data and sell your data into slavery where it'll be bound in the bowels of a slave ship and sent to people who will then take advantage of it. And and ExpressVPN is just going to confuse the fuck out of all these people, just like I am right now, so that your connection is rerouted through so many different places, they'll think you're the goddamn Flash. And they'll just give up and move on to an easier picking sucker. And every time you connect to ExpressVPN, you get a random IP address shared by many other ExpressVPN customers. So they can't pinpoint exactly what you're doing, they'll think that everybody's into Dalmatian porn. No. And the best of all, ExpressVPN is super easy to use. No matter what kind of device you're on, phone, laptop, smart TV, electronic listening device, telephone bugging apparatus, all you got to do is tap one button and boom, they think you're in Bolivia. Your, Your package is going to the Republic of Congo. So if you really want to go incognito, Brian, and protect your privacy, I think the the people out there, they they owe it to themselves to secure themselves with the number one rated VPN. And that stands stands for very private number. This is even better than That's not what it stands for. That's why, well, of course that's what it stands for. And, And express means you get it quickly. Like in the old days, you called a phone company for $2 a month, I still have the service. You get a non-published number. And that means it doesn't go into the telephone book, just with all the riffraff and the the knickknacks and paddywhacks. You don't want to be in the telephone book unless you're a business, because then everybody knows you're a sucker for aluminum siding. So get your unlisted number quickly from Express Very Private Number or ExpressVPN.com for short. I don't really understand anything you're talking about, but let's talk about People can get access to websites with everything happening right now with the WWE Network about to be shut down. Yes. Content moving to Netflix, some content on Peacock. This is a great way for international listeners. Before they take it away from you, record all this shit. Why didn't say record it? You have access to it. Well, they won't know what you're doing in your own home because you've got ExpressVPN. They think you're in fucking Calcutta. What are you going to record it on? Well, on a goddamn DVD or a VHS tape like <laughs> yeah. God intended. Because when they take the network away, I've still got all my shit. But anyway, you can get three months of this shit for free. I'll tell you that by cracky. If you go to expressvpn.com slash JCE, you'll get three extra months for free with the slash JCE. And we know what you know what you're using this for. You're using it to stay away from people who are trying to keep an eye on you and or what you might be visiting on the way of websites. And or you just want to access things that you may not be able to access where you are because of something that's not available in your country, like the great yes. British sewing bee. Or maybe you want to access some type of video that you don't want the uh, the baron of the, uh, the the castle that your spousal person is to come in there and... <laughs> That was a hell of a series of words you threw at <laughs> Yes. <laughs> if you, if you want to make sure that your significant other is significantly confused about what you're looking at on the end, all these things, it's, it's, it's good for a variety of these things. You don't want the next door neighbors chiming in on this either. You know, they can take binoculars and look in the window and see what website that you're visiting unless you get ExpressVPN and then the whole thing is scrambled like the old Barker channels on the pay-per-views. ExpressVPN.com slash JCE, three extra months for free of this valuable service to protect your secrecy and security and privacy. Privacy is a big deal. 
That's right. And of course, ExpressVPN is there for you. It's the number one yes. VPN, and you can get access to all sorts of content on the internet from around the world. ExpressVPN, yes. what's that promo code, Jim? J-C-E, and protect your privacy, because everyone wants their, their privy protected. All right. All right. Well, before we go any further, I thought that we would kind of update ourselves on uh, just get a grip on some of the previous news before we go to the new news. And it, it, there's also a timeline. We asked somebody or asked anybody actually on the show, put together a timeline of some of this. Well, our, our good buddy over there, Thurston Howell the third, um, put together it at WrestleNomics, put together a timeline of the business news and and uh, basically all of the things that went on behind the scenes from the point of time that the NDA was signed. That that a blanket description it covers everything. January 28th, 2022 is when when Janelle Grant signed the NDA releasing Vince McMahon and the WWE according to the complaint that she's just filed, right? Right. So that was the start of this thing and <laughs> He put together a timeline of the shit, which we're obviously not going to read everything, and you can't. And it would be, a week. I mean, you can, but not on, on the air verbally like this. It would be very confusing. But we encourage everybody to. But the, the fucking thing is, in, in hindsight now, you see a lot of these people involved who... <laughs> It looks like Stephanie, at least, has been trying to stay away from Vince for the past two years. Whenever he comes, she is show publicly, oh, it's great to have Vince back, and she's fucking gone, right? That's happened on a couple of different occasions. And when you and I were talking right before we went on the air, it was only two months after this NDA was signed that the anonymous email came from the person who said that they were the friend of the unnamed at that time, former WWE paralegal. And that was WrestleMania week. And the very week that the board of directors gets this news that there's an NDA and starts all these investigations and starts all these balls rolling. That was when Vince came back and, and I use in quotation marks, wrestled at WrestleMania when he had that deal where they had the thing set up with McAfee and Austin Theory, right? And then Vince, through whatever twists and turns they ended up taking, listen to our review on YouTube. He inserted himself in it and it fucking stunk. And then poor Steve Austin had to come out and give Vince the stunner that broke his, both of his legs, you know, in pieces, it looked like. He just collapsed into a goddamn melted heap. So <laughs> he has been, but that, that was the first, the, the first time that the news comes to the board of directors, Vince puts himself on WrestleMania and beats Pat McAfee. And then... When the Wall Street Journal, what, April, May, June, three months later, reports this, when they find out about it, that the board has been investigating all this shit, that's when he came out on SmackDown and Raw those two weeks. And like, here's John Cena, and here I am. Fuck all of you. But in, in, in the middle, and I'm jumping all around, but in the middle, in May, Stephanie step down says she, she's taking a leave of absence to spend more time with her family apparently the family that didn't already work for the company right and so she was gone at that point she was still on the board and when vince tried to come back she was one of the people voting for him not to come back and when he came back anyway she fucking welcomed him back and fucking quit again and remember she went on tv and led the audience in a thank you vince chant no actually remember Remember, she didn't lead. The audience started doing that. And I think I said at the time, she stepped on his chant. I don't think she started it. Let's go back. 
enterprising sleuths that have more time on their hands than we do go back and see I think the people started it and I don't know that she did any encouragement at any at, at the least but I think she may have stepped on it we said oh, she stepped on the chant I had a baby I'm thinking of another one. and I think it's important to differentiate two things here at the start one as you mentioned before the friend of Janelle Grant got in touch with the board of directors with that letter and then separate from that it appears that someone on the board of directors got in touch with the Wall Street Journal. Yes. And th there's also, if you go down in this timeline, as soon as Vince does power his way back, he drop, he fires, or I don't know, can you fire the board? He moves the board of director people out, and a couple of them quit. And, and one or two of them had gone on record as saying that we didn't agree with this, and we don't want to be here. But that's that you can tell who is so Stephanie takes the leave of absence, you know, when she after WrestleMania that year and the rumor tried to be floated that Vince either removed her or she wasn't doing a good job or whatever, which that didn't get a lot of traction. But then when all the NDA news breaks, all of a sudden Triple H replaces John Laurinaitis and talent relations, which was the the reverse that had happened a number of years ago when Vince put Laurinaitis back in Triple H's spot and Vince retired the same day as Triple H replaced Laurinaitis and Brock walked out of the TV taping the same day. And then Steph came back when Triple H was back in and Vince was out. And then two weeks later, they fired Laurinaitis. But then, by four months later, Vince is back in. Stephanie and Triple H both vote no, but it doesn't matter. So does Nick Khan. So does Nick Khan. And they even write a letter to him explaining that they don't think it would be beneficial to the company to come back. And he says, in my position, he can insist on whatever he wants because he had the power. In my position, I feel that I have to be there for this sale of the company. I will not accept anything unless I'm yeah. part of it. Basically saying, uh, no, nothing will happen unless I okay it. So I'm going to fuck all you guys. But anyways, and Stephanie, you know, welcome and welcomed him back and then left for fucking good. And it, it also, if you add up a couple of the bonuses and stock sales and whatever that Vince, after the whole sale and merger and TKO deal happened, Vince has sold stock for or gotten as some type of bonus over $750 million and still owns 12% of the company. It's not enough to cause what he caused before, but that's the point is he's gotten $750 million out of this deal so far. He owns stock in a company that's worth much more than that. And they're where they're at right now because he didn't pay three million dollars to this woman. And 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 let's not let's talk about that a little because it's such what a puzzling thing. What kind of an idiot is he? We've talked in the past about this is what Vince McMahon has done to a lot of people outside of sexual misconduct allegations, doing business with them. Here's the deal. All of a sudden, you stop getting the payments. He finds some kind of way out of the deal. He did something he didn't like. He screwed over Larry Matisic. Mike LaBelle, Stu Hart, the list goes on and on, not even counting the predatory business practices that he did against the NWA and Crockett Promotions. But he always finds a way, if it's good for him, he's either going to get out of the deal or get a deal, only if it's good for him. He pays her. She says in the complaint, she didn't understand why he couldn't just give her all the money all at once. And he said, I think it was for like a state planning or something. He just couldn't. No, it, it was a, a cash flow or cash what? Cash flow. Uh, that's what it have was. The, yeah. Spread out the <laughs> cash <laughs> flow. But now, he, you know, here's the thing. We have also been, it's been reported. I hesitate to say we found out or anything factually these days anymore, but it's been reported reliably that these NDAs, all of them, that Vince signed, because this one was for $3 million, but the investigation that this one snowballed into, remember they found 17 or $18 million to women and then another 
fucking five to seven million dollars he gave to fucking Trump illegally that we see more similarities. It, the deals don't apply. He always finds some. But anyway. And he had apparently Jerry McDivitt draw these up and have these deals signed without the knowledge of the WWE as a company is what the story is now being told. So that that's why when they found out about them, they had to not only revise their their earnings or their financial report or whatever it was, but also if the company didn't actually know that these were signed and that this was going on, then that does alleviate some of the culpability, liability, whatever the fuck, especially of this new company now. But, uh, but the point is, could, they, could this be, uh, could this be the, the first time that Jerry McDivitt has fucked something up? Or allowed something to be, you know, fucked up and legally that bad. You know, Vince has lost before. A lot of people forget that. Jesse Ventura kicked his ass in court. Bill Eady beat him in court. Again, I was reading, I mentioned this to you recently, the Six Pack by Brad Baluchian. He talks to Bill Eady and he tries to get something about the settlement. Whatever he got from WWE, he wouldn't say anything. He just smiled and said he's very happy. And that took 10 years. The lawsuit was like from 1991, it was settled in 2001. Vince McMahon drew that thing out for 10 years. And Bill Eady ended up winning in the end, apparently. So, you know, Jerry McDivitt isn't immune. It all depends on this specific situation and the case and who's willing to fight. Well, but also when you think of the gravity of the two suits, I got Bill Eady over here. I got this massive international news right. story disgracing me over here. It seems like they might have taken a little more care. The other thing is we only know what we know. And the Wall Street Journal reported that there were these other deals. I mean, some of them go back to like 2006, 2007, somewhere in there. He was making deals back then. We don't know how far back these go. It's puzzling that these weren't personal NDAs. It was company-wide, which he shouldn't have done. But the biggest problem always comes down to the fact that even though it was a public company, Vince still ran it the way he always did. It was his company. And he can do whatever he wants at any time, and the shareholders let him do it. That's the fact. He was able to spend and do whatever he wanted. The shareholders let him do whatever he wanted. And as by the way, um, you know, when you look at some of the people, because of course there's the only people identified in the lawsuit are Vince McMahon and John Laurinaitis, but obviously because of the Overwhelming circumstantial evidence Brock Lesnar's not looking too good, and we'll talk about his current status in a second. But the thing is, everybody's wondering what who the other corporate executives are and etc. Corporate officer number one or number two or number whatever the case. And you know, I, is it now even more significant than just new ownership? And again, I'm not even saying just because I don't like the guy. I'm not saying that he was doing any wrongdoing, but I'm saying he, you know, he's a fly on the wall close enough to the inner circle he might have known if some alleged wrongdoing was being done. Kevin Dunn leaves at the end of the year with one week's notice, right? Didn't he? Was didn't, it wasn't even it that announced much? around Christmas time? Yeah, I'm going to finish up the end of the year. I don't know it how much some, notice he gave. He was just gone one day. Some short period of time. Well, he had, the, they announced uh, when we covered it. I said, well, Jesus Christ, it's fucking holidays. It's the end of the year, even like five days later, whatever. That's a month before this lawsuit is filed. Would you... One would think that if Kevin Dunn was one of the closest people to Vince and... You would think that you would know as a person involved in something like this, if something was, was bubbling before it happened, you think Kevin wanted to get out before he got any on him just for being around. I you don't know, know. The Ashley Massaro stories, and there's various ones going around, and I believe her attorney uh, has recently spoken, uh, done an interview somewhere, and I'm sure we'll hear more about it. But I saw something recently with Paul London who I guess was dating her at a time. And he said that she hated going on the plane, but Vince and Kevin Dunn always wanted her on the plane. 
not just Vince, Vince and Kevin Dunn. You say Kevin Dunn's a fly on a wall. He was Vince's top lieutenant for years. Got away with everything. I mean, we heard stories that were just stupid. Like, I know someone who had a meeting with Kevin Dunn. He started cutting his toenails in the middle of the meeting. Just a complete <laughs> dirtbag move. But it's not a safe thing to assume that everyone didn't have an idea there was something going on, even if they didn't know exactly what. If there were mistresses hired to work in the office, and right away people knew, how did they know right away? How did they know any of that? All these other things happening with talent, anything that happened with talent, that shit goes around amongst the talent pretty quick. So it's, well, it's Laurenitis who was in charge of talent relations at various points. Kevin Dunn was the head of production. We don't know what he knew. You know, the big thing that's going to be interesting is going to be Triple H and Stephanie. And I hate to say it because I like Triple H's wrestling product. But if you're that close to Vince and you're around him nonstop for years, not, in, not just in the arena, in the office, and all this was happening, and people knew he had a mistress in the office who got a job she didn't deserve, or deserve may not be the word, wasn't qualified for. I don't know. I mean, that's the thing. Who knew what and when is the thing that's going to probably bring down a bunch of people. Well, that's why, yeah, with Kevin Dunn, again, not saying he was pretend, and I can't even imagine trying to participate in anything with Kevin Dunn. My God. Be like trying to get romantic with fucking Willard. <laughs> but the, he, if anybody knew something was going on, he had to be one of the people who knew just because of that proximity. And from reading the complaint, I, and I said, I, I worked in the office or darkened their doorstep in 20-something years, uh, but some people were around there for a long time. Others have been newer additions. One of the unnamed executives, or however described, from I think I might know who that might be, and from my interaction with him, I would think that if Vince McMahon... If he thought Vince McMahon has a girl on the side and he's putting her on the payroll, he would have rolled his eyes and held his nose and gone along with it, whatever. I think if he'd have known almost any of these details, you'd have needed shock paddles to bring him around. Because he was an older white man who would have also been aghast. That's a word that doesn't get used a lot aghast at the obvious jeopardy that it was putting the company and the participants in because he was a halfway level-headed individual so but uh, but if you were but if, if a hypothetical person and that and that of, would that wouldn't be bruce pritchard by the way uh, i'm not talking about bruce okay i thought you were talking about bruce no no i said level-headed that's why i was confused for a second yeah well no it wouldn't have no, a, a, a person whose name wouldn't even be known to the vast majority of the wrestling fans. What? That's a part of the story. Vince all of a sudden bringing back people that the company got rid of to surround himself with, like Bruce Pritchard, like John Laurinaita. People were around him that other people in the company like, why is this person here? They're only here because of Vince. He well, wants them and, here not because of anything they're adding to anything. He just wants his confidence. And see, that's... Uh, suddenly it looked like that he was bringing in the the padding to surround himself with rather than his own daughter and his own son-in-law. And it was the only time that they gained power, retained power, or weren't fucked with in some kind of way was because Vince had taken NXT away from Triple H. And then, you know, he was out for a period of time with the heart issue, which... You know, I've said probably the last thing that I think he would have want to thought about when he was having heart problems was Vince's fucking issues. But I'm, um, you know, anyway, um, we'll talk about Triple H when we talk about The Rock later on. But with Stephanie, is there any public sighting of her? Is she anywhere doing anything? I'm not talking about in wrestling, just is she you know, uh, taking the kids to soccer games, or does anybody know what she's doing? Hey, another interesting thing that's in the timeline here that you talked about, remember, after all this first went down, Vince, Stephanie, Triple H, and Pat McAfee went and sat ringside at a UFC event. 
Ooh, you're right. Some sort of show of force. You know, it wasn't just Vince going to check yeah. out an event with Pat McAfee, who's a star. He brought Stephanie and Triple H with him. <laughs> Unless they were negotiating with Endeavor in the back on that night. What was that about? Well, that may have been part of the thing that was about. And, and okay, and here, Brock Lesnar. What the f Talk about somebody shitting in their own post-toasties. He is not only a WWE legend and the biggest per capita, per match box office attraction, probably maybe now except for The Rock or whatever, and he's also a former UFC champion and an MMA legend. This, the same company now owns both, and they can't fucking put him out in front of people. How he, we've now come to find out that he was pulled from the Royal Rumble, the spot that Braun Breaker had was going to be Brock Lesnar, and, and actually because the match was laid out, they're saying all the shit that Braun Breaker did was supposed to be Brock Lesnar, and now you look at it, you can see it. And you can also see that Braun Breaker did it pretty much as good. Yeah, it worked and, out well for Braun Breaker, but that would have been Brock Lesnar's spot, the thing with almost, and then Dominic Mysterio eliminating him. Yes, because apparently they were going to have Brock kick the shit out of Dominic because he's got heat at Elimination Chamber and then do something at WrestleMania. So he got pulled from three pay-per-views in a row. There's a new WWE game. I want to say a card game, did I read? Is that is that code for one of the fucking electronic devices the kids have these days, a card game? I'm not sure what game you're talking about. Well, there, there's a new WWE game that Brock Lesnar was in that the toy company said, well, we're not going to leave him in it, and they took him out of it. So three pay-per-views and a goddamn game, that's co already cost him, what, two or three million dollars. And he and they haven't even mentioned his name yet. But boy, I'd like to see him try, come out and say, well, prove it's me, because I think they can. What if he goes for the Laurinaitis defense? I'm a victim in this too. My boss was telling oh me things God. to do. And that would be the f fucking Thor, the God of Thunder said, I was fucking victimized by the fucking Dr. Don Blake. On the topic of Brock, to go way back and taking your personal feelings out of it because other people felt differently about her than you did, specifically Vince and Kevin Dunn. <laughs> when Sable first left, she sued them for sexual harassment, remember? Yes. You know, who knows what was really there and what really wasn't. They were obsessed with her. Well, it... it and that's Brock's wife. Well, that's what I was going to say, but then there's the, the O. Henry uh, there. We got O. henry because then I could understand if, if, if the story was that after Brock and Sable got together, then Brock hated Vince because of whatever his wife may have told him. We don't know. But no, Brock becomes close enough to Vince that when Vince retires, Brock walks out and Vince is setting, allegedly, Brock up with play dates with the office personnel. And you have to wonder... That seems to be a contradiction, doesn't it? You have to wonder, is this because Vince and Brock are especially close, or did Vince have this kind of relationship or try to pull this kind of thing with top guys that he was negotiating with? Is there anyone else? I mean, there's a lot of guys he's been close to over the years. Hogan lived next door to him in Greenwich at one point. Him and Shawn Michaels are real tight. Him and Brett, before everything went bad, were real tight. There are a lot of guys that had really close relationships with Vince. A lot of guys that did when Linda was around and acted. But, but that perks like this, I use perks in quotation marks because of the alleged offering in the contract negotiations, etc., didn't come up from Vince back then. There's no way, there's no way any of those guys, well, I mean, Bret Hart, you wouldn't even say that too, for fuck's sake. He would have goddamn probably punched Vince early. <laughs> and, but you, there's no way that you would have been able to keep these guys from saying that at one point or another, if there had ever been, and I mean, this specific story, yeah, Vince tried to get me to fuck his girlfriend or or his office employee, or his massage therapist, or fill in the blank. Or shared picture. Vince showed me nude pictures of this girl that he's having this fling with. That That's never been a, a part of the canon of the mythology, has it? I don't think so. I mean, I, I don't know everything, but I had never heard that. But 
What we had heard is that Vincent had affairs in the office. Remember, his assistant was Emily Feinberg, who was a Playboy playmate. And she ended up getting screwed. I don't say get screwed, but she testified against Vince in the steroid trial. And Laura Brevetti's ex-husband, she was one of Vince's attorneys, went up to Emily Feinberg pretending to be a reporter for 60 Minutes, got her whole story, and then she got destroyed on the stand. Yeah. So Vince, that was with Linda there. He was sleeping with his assistant. Well, yes, but he wouldn't say it. Hey, uh, Brutus, you know, come on over. What do you think, um, you know, we'll talk more about it because it kind of is involved with every single thing we're going to talk about with WWE TV coming up. But Triple H, you know, WWE, their product has been the best it's been in a long time. The TV has great segments with confrontations that we love and that we talk about here. He's doing his thing without Vince. Everything seemed to be going well. We'll talk later about how The Rock kind of gets thrown into that and changes everything. But, you know, he's finally got his chance to do it, and he may get dragged down by this if he's involved in any way. Well, but I've got to think, because they are dealing with each other, the Nick Cons and the Triple H's and the Ari Emanuel's, and they're dealing with each other, I would think, on a regular, daily, or almost daily basis, and they know more than we do, whether they want to admit it or not, and they've got to probably have formulated some opinion in a positive fashion about Triple H's involvement or lack thereof before they've let him get this far. They right? made Vince the executive chairman. There's no way that Endeavor wasn't aware of some of these allegations, or at least multiple issues with Vince and the company and sexual harassment and NDAs. And they still made him executive chairman. What does the executive chairman do? He's the executive chairman of the board of directors. So he's the head of the board of directors. So what would he actually have be able to do in that or have been able to do in that company before he resigned it? Oh, I don't know what exact power who could he, he have. tell who could he say, you motherfucker Go goddamn lift that fucking barge and I mean, tote that bail. I mean, technically, he was the boss of Dana White and Triple H in one respect. But, but here's the... I'm asking, how much was ceremonial to be the executive chairman to placate this fucking eccentric, demented senior citizen that we're trying to get this... And he's going to die soon. We won't have to worry about him because he's almost 80. But in the meantime, would he have been able to call up Dana White and say, hey, that fucking ma main event you're plugging for the next pay-per-view, fuck it. Change it. I don't like you. He wouldn't be able to do that. But they were asked about all these things. There was a CNBC interview with Ari Emanuel next to Vince, and he was asked about it, and he said he wanted Vince there. They needed Vince there. Dana White said good things about Vince. I have a tough time thinking these guys were not aware of something going on. And they were all I, praising I, Vince. Did they think this was all going away? Did they well, think that, that that's what I'm saying is I I, I think it's it, both these things can happen at the same time. I think they fear we've got to give because he wouldn't accept his ego wouldn't accept anything less than some type of position like this. But much of it may have been ceremonial, so they knew he couldn't fuck the company up, and they were figuring either they didn't know the extent of it, or they were figuring it wouldn't come out in public the extent of it, and people get over. NDAs and hush money all the time, just not with details like this going on. I I would have to think that even that company, had they learned the extent of this, would not have, you know... If they get yeah. before a jury, can you imagine how much they're going to reward Janelle Grant and punitive damages? I mean, you talk about all the money Vince has, and that's going to come up in that trial. He's going to lose a good chunk of it. Okay, well, speaking of losing money, we talked about Brock is out a few million dollars just so far just from you know being uh, alluded to in this with Laurenitis how deep can he how how big a settlement could he pay certainly not like Vince McMahon cuz remember we talked about him on the previous program i said how could he have been that fearful for his fucking job because he's been a wrestling executive, major company for most of the past 20 or 25 years, whatever the fuck. My God, he's not going to be in a box under the overpass. That's not if he's living a goddamn normal life. 
and not the subject of a multi-million dollar lawsuit. So I don't buy that he was so fearful for his job that he would not perpetrate crimes on behalf of Vince's say-so, even when Vince wasn't present. But I can believe that he would squeal like a pig under a gate at Vince or about Vince McMahon if he's staring in the face of a 10 or $15 million or who knows what kind of fucking judgment in a civil suit, which is why that apparently he's already, I was a victim here. Have you heard about his lawyer? I mean, I saw the quote from the lawyer. I don't know anything else about no. the lawyer. Okay, you know, I'm not one to tell tales, and I'm not one to to, to prattle, on, you know, and, and tell tales out of school or cast aspersions on people. So I encourage everybody, do your own research. I'm not saying that this is completely valid information, but a lot of people said it. Apparently, on Twitter, I've seen people screenshotting the fucking reviews or the comments from wherever it came from, the attorney that is representing John Laurinaitis is apparently not well regarded at all with, by many of his former clients. And oh. they're saying, what a lazy piece of shit, what a crook, he stole money, he fucked me around, he did this and that. I'm not saying these things about this apparently shyster lawyer because he might get on the phone and call our shyster lawyer and it would start something. I'm saying if anybody's got some spare time, and wants to do the research on the guy representing John Laurinaita, see what you come up with, is all I'm saying. But a lot of, a lot of neg negativity. You know, and Laurinaitis is a guy that's not well thought of by too many people. <laughs> no, like beyond you, like Jim Ross has made statements in the past publicly. Teddy Long has made statements in the past publicly. Various talent have made comments. He wasn't well thought like of. you phrased it. He just wasn't well thought of, like you know, goddamn sardines on fucking pizza. He just wasn't well thought of. Like, I've never heard anyone ever say to me, you know, he does a good job. Give him a break. No one. Everyone thought he did a bad job. Everyone thought he was unqualified for his job. And then you hear all this. Well, remember at first, Stephanie liked him because he was a smiling, younger, good-looking guy in a suit that replaced Jim Ross, who was telling... Vince, the chairman, the truth. Yeah. the truth about her creative performances. And then he morphed into whatever he fucking became. Can you imagine what Stephanie thought when Bruce Pritchard got rehired? She's the one who got him fired <laughs> for pulling a gun on her or whatever. Uh, oh, he, oh, now don't say that. Waving a gun around like Yosemite Sam, whatever he was doing. He didn't pull pew, a gun pew, on pew. Stephanie McMahon. Apparently, he did have a gun in his briefcase for reasons that I've I've not ever been told or understood or yeah, whatever. Well, but he doesn't have heat. What was he running around with a gun for? I, who knows? Well, you, <laughs> you, he was in the office, right? <laughs> You're talking about heat with the fans. If I was here, I could go in a fucking arena of 15,000 people and feel safe, but I wouldn't want to go in the office and turn my back without. But nevertheless, so that's Laurinaitis. He can't afford to pay a big settlement. And he's got a lawyer that apparently one would presume by the way he's been described that he will represent anybody for a fee and figure out something to either. Maybe he's a personal friend of Johnny's. Who knows? And these, this is some of the other things that I've been thinking about. What's going on right now since this complaint has been filed and made public, the lawsuit by Janelle Grant. I have questions still on what the fucking arrangement is here. And maybe we got another clue on who the friend of Janelle Grant was because the story is that Janelle Grant was living in this building. Vince was living in the penthouse. Janelle Grant knew the manager of the building. And the manager of the building said, well, you ought to talk to Vince McMahon. He's a billionaire. He might give you a job, right? Right. And then later on, after these things happened to her with the WWE, apparently she managed, or or, I guess, did she become the building manager? Or was the building manager, was she running the building in some fashion? I don't know if she took his job. That's a very interesting question. I didn't thought was about it that. a his or a her? I'm not sure, but they had said that she had taken over, she had been working in the building she was living in. 
Yes. And so did she take over? Was she handling something else for the main manager? Was the manager, were they girlfriends? Were they, you one would think that Janelle Grant would not have confided in some old guy that looked like fucking, you know, bookman on what's happening or whatever. Well, we don't know. We don't know who the building manager was. and Well, but I'm saying maybe they were females of a similar age where they could bond or, you know, whatever. But so, and I, that's the thing is that here's the, what I don't understand now. And the, again, how old is Janelle Grant? Now you said you, no newspapers reported she was 43, but I'd heard that she was in her twenties and the picture of her looks youthful, but now people are saying she's in her, why is her age up in the air? Not that she did anything wrong with that, but I think you don't need specifics. Here's where she lives. If you want to go bother her, but clarifying her general biography enough to see how she clearly ended up in this odd situation, I think would help humanize her even more, make people understand what fuck's going on. If it's sympathetic to her case. And so if did Vince move, is, it, is he still living there? Is the manager mad at him? The building manager. If the building manager was friends with Janelle Grant and gets a job, says, go talk to Vince, and Vince gives her a job, and then the building manager finds out about this, was the building manager the one that emailed the board, the friend of Janelle Grant? That is an interesting question. We know Vince has a residence in Florida, obviously, and who knows what other places, you know, maybe a place in Manhattan or something. He but. don't spend a lot of time in Florida when he's doing these fucking business deals. Does he still have that condo in the Trump building that Janelle Grant lives in? That's a very interesting question. Yes, so that's what I'm saying is, if I was the building manager and I was really truly friends with Janelle Grant and I really had a genuine idea to try to help by saying, well, talk to Vince McMahon. He, you know, is a, could give you a job. And then Janelle Grant confided in me that uh, this had gone on. Wouldn't I feel like shit? And wouldn't I think, well, somebody needs to fucking do something about this. Right? So then wouldn't I be the anonymous friend that emailed the fucking board of directors? But at the same time, when the NDA was signed, Vince, if was Vince still, did they have to pass each other in the lobby? Were they still living there? Did she move? But she ca couldn't have moved because why would you move away from a building that you're then going to work managing? And the story why th that she had to give up that job was that she was so upset and disturbed by what had happened that she was depressed and couldn't leave her apartment for weeks at a time. So who, I can't, think that the man building manager that put her together with Vince, did he then or she then flip and side with Vince McMahon? But then how did Janelle Grant get the job? We need details. Yeah, we God don't know. It. Cause it says just a friend of Janelle Grant. And if she has friends and she's going through something like this, you got to think some other people may be aware of that something's up. What I'm thinking somebody needs to talk to the building manager and find out who what the building manager knew when. What I'm, really, and, what I'm really oh, interested yeah. in that we may never find out is who leaked this to the Wall Street Journal, because that changed everything. That I was the game changer. Was, I think it was somebody on the board of directors. It could have either been one of the civilians that weren't in the wrestling business that were on the board of directors that were just mortified at conduct like this, or it could have been fucking Stephanie. I don't know. I still don't know. Because would, would that be sitting well with, you know... We haven't heard anything from the family. I mean, Triple H had that press conference, didn't say anything, but obviously Shane, Stephanie, and Linda, who's still making appearances for, you know, various Republican events, living by herself in Florida, not living with Vince. That's right. Linda, somebody sent a poster with... She's speaking with every right-wing Republican wing nut. How can she... Are these people in such a bubble of their own delusions that they don't read the paper or watch the news? How can she poke her face out there after this? Boy. Uh. There was a conspiracy theory, and I only call it that because it's unproven, going around that maybe Shane McMahon was the person who leaked this to the Wall Street Journal. <sighs> Remember, he came back. When did Shane McMahon come back to the Royal Rumble where he had some kind of incident backstage? And then his dad said, don't come back. and. 
He almost got into a fight with Brock. When was that? <laughs> right? Is that the details you remember? Yes. Um, oh, God damn it. We got to listen to our own YouTube channel. We covered it at the time. It's been a couple of years ago. That's when Shane blew his snavitz out. Was that 2022? Um, yeah, that was 2022. He was paid over $700,000 for the Royal Rumble in 2022. But backstage, yes. I have a story here. Backstage chaos and clashing with Brock Lesnar saw him quietly let go by his father. Wow. So that's another big well, question. Remember also the, a lot of the guys had been mad that he had inserted himself into the, the match and the whole nine yards. And then he, you know, went down in spectacular fashion. He's the one I hope one day says something because he's the only one who ever walked away for whatever reason. And now all of this yeah. makes you wonder what else could have been going on. But he walked away and tried to do something on his own. He would eventually come I told come back. you he was my favorite. You always said that. At this point, he may be my favorite too. <laughs> <laughs> but I have a tough time thinking all of this wasn't known by some of these participants or a good amount of this wasn't known by a lot of these participants. I, uh, the detail, <laughs> I, I, I need to know the amount of details now. Here's another thing. I, I've thought of something that nobody else has asked about. The physical therapist, right? Right. Who are his patients right now? Why is he unnamed? I mean, what the, who, this is a, a physical therapist that leads one to believe medical professional People actively or person actively seeing clients, patients, or whatever. What does he adjust your back and give you a shit shampoo? Can somebody review his fucking license? Just give a little asterisk at the Better Business Bureau. Shouldn't people, if there's somebody out there that's engaging in this behavior with alleged clients, shouldn't we know about it? Who's the physical therapist? Who's the celebrity doctor he was working for that Vince sent Janelle Grant to? Well, there, there you go. And either what is the doctor's celebrity or what celebrities is this doctor seeing? Because as George Carlin said, somewhere in the world is the world's worst doctor. And someone has an appointment with him tomorrow morning. I think we ought to have this knowledge shared with us. And uh, you, you mentioned Bruce earlier. I think he's toast because he's been so close to Vince and with the company so long, they're just going to get rid of him because, just because. I think that while I believe there is no way that he could have been involved as a participant in this, I think it, I think he mounted probably a vigorous, a vigorous effort at remaining willfully ignorant. But I think there's also the story the of his life. Well, there you and and he's excellent at it. And I think that there's some level of Vince may have shielded him from discussion of this on a personal basis for plausible deniability. Just uh, for situations just like this, he kept his feathers numbered because if Bruce didn't know nothing, didn't see nothing, didn't hear nothing, didn't talk about nothing, Vince would say, well, Bruce can be there when I'm not. And then, as Ronda Rousey said, he can be the avatar. But if Vince is showing everyone things on his phone, and we only know that based on what Vince said in text messages, Bruce is the only person he's not showing stuff to? I think Bruce would have treated it like a pickle on his plate and looked out the window. Nope, nope, nope. Bruce has the thing. Bruce <laughs> always had a saying. I don't rib, don't want to be ribbed. As it, meaning he is not going to rib anyone or mess with anyone's belongings or whatever the fuck back in the, the 80s WWF style ribs, and he don't want to be ribbed. Don't rib, don't want to be ribbed. I think he would extend that. Don't fuck, don't want to be fucked. I don't know how he, you know, he doesn't survive, I don't think, but also, how does anyone ever want to hear him again? All this guy ever did was defend Vince McMahon, defend everything Vince McMahon ever did. Give that side of the story. And now all of a sudden he's not going to say anything about this? We'll see. He's got a lot to own up to about all of this. He got brought back to be Vince's Well, he doesn't company. have to own up to anything. He has to talk about what he knows and what he doesn't know. He has to, he has to spill his guts, but he doesn't have to own up to it. 
Well, I think a lot of people have a lot to answer for. Kevin Dunn, Bruce Pritchard, John Laurinaitis, Stephanie McMahon, Vince McMahon, other unnamed executives, the other people on the board of directors, including those who resigned, giving rather benign statements about, you know, we had a problem with st- things that were here. Not yeah, really we, we, letting we, you know. We've got busy schedules. We, You know, the kids now, they're doing soccer. And Endeavor. Again, Nick Khan was one of the people that voted for Vince not to be brought back. Nick Khan didn't know what was going on. Endeavor knew what was going on, too, I would have to think. So every one of these people is going to have to answer for this. And I'm sure they're all dreading it. I'm sure they're all dreading it. But it's coming. That day is coming. It's a reckoning. It's the reckoning Vince McMahon never thought would happen. Boy. I well, gotta, that, I, that, I, I gotta get David Schultz on the phone, find out how he's doing nowadays. Oh, okay. <laughs> Wait a minute, you haven't, you haven't heard him hooping and hollering and shooting his shotgun off? I'm sure he's that, having a That party. brings us to Vince to close the, the, the most unsympathetic defendant since Donald Trump. And with him on the stand in a civil trial, just with the text and just his, his the demeanor that he's probably going to have and the way he's going to come off, he's cooked. He's still got the multiple NDAs for tens of millions of dollars. Are any of them valid? Are any of them enforceable? Yeah, that's the other thing, because I guess they were, again, they're company NDAs. They're not Vince McMahon NDAs. No, no. They're, that's the thing is that uh, from the report that I'm hearing, the company may be covered, but the company didn't do them. Vince had them done by McDivitt privately rather than going through the company. Oh, that's legal. right. I said it backwards. I said it backwards. But, well, but no, but they cover the company, but they covered, they potentially would, in that case, would cover the company without the company's knowledge. Right. Which so, is not legal. <laughs> I don't believe it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's why I'm saying they can be challenged. And I mean, I don't know if anybody's going to be anxious to give the fucking money back or if they thought there might be a danger of that. But if McDivitt did him personally, and that's a Vince and Jerry McDivitt, Jerry, poor Jerry wanted to retire. Maybe he's going to, maybe Vince is going to be floating in the wilderness on his own after this. And maybe if McDivitt did draw these up, maybe he's not the guy to defend this suit anyway. Yeah, maybe he wants to retire before this trial because this may not be one you could win. Well, but uh, Grant's lawyer says others are coming forward. What are these stories? And they have shown they're not hesitant to put some out. And there's a federal investigation going on that's criminal, not civil. And they got his phone. And they got his phone. There it is. Because he's text. I said this last time. He's texting all these things to Janelle Grant. And they're hideous. What was he sending the other participants, like Laurenitis and the physical therapist and Brock Lesnar? We don't see those text messages. We only see the sweet nothings that he's sending to someone who he's abusing. But we don't see... And you know what? That's the one thing. Trump never put anything in writing. That was how he got away with everything. Vince didn't even learn from his billionaire buddy. You know, (sighs) on this topic, let me ask you a question I've been thinking about. I was a big Chris Benoit fan. I can't watch Chris Benoit matches. I hate the guy. I can't watch his matches at all anymore. If I see him on a show, it, like an old show, it repulses me. The most successful era in WWE history is the Attitude Era, which is all built around Vince and Steve Austin. What does this do to that, to that legacy, to that footage, the idea that the biggest draw in company history, Steve Austin, is tied directly to Mr. McMahon? That if you ever want to revisit any of these things in the past, Vince is all over all of these clips. Well, but it, can you not watch any movie that Joan Crawford ever appeared in without thinking about her beating her fucking kids with wire hangers? I mean, I'm not watching too many Joan Crawford movies nowadays. Well, I mean, it's but, a broad example. Right. But, you know, but that's a little bit different than, you know, Mommy Dearest is a little bit different than whatever the fuck Vince had going on there. I know that, but the point I'm making is at some point you, you, in entertainment or in rock and roll or in sports or in football or in fuck it, I don't know, uh, rocket research down in Huntsville, Alabama at the Von Braun fucking center or whatever, there's going to be shitty people that do great things in a field that you're interested in. And... <sighs> To be honest, 
I, I, I think Vince is is worse than Benoit's, but to me, I can I can watch a Chris Benoit match and I get sad because of that, you know, that great kid that whose brain melted and went crazy and did all those things. But with Vince, he was the with, host of the show. He was the person who eventually was an on-air character making out with women, having women do. Remember Stacy Keyword dancing on a table? Yeah, in front no, of him and, that that stuff may not age well. And there's a lot of that stuff. There's a lot of that stuff. Him but, having sable all over him, that was a thing in like 2003 or whatever. You know, and, and I and I I can admit I identify. I was heartbroken when it because I cannot ever hear goddamn Ted Nugent again. Cat scratch fever without thinking, but yes, he's now a Republican dipshit. Yeah, I feel that way about color, I know. feel that way about Roger Waters. I like Pink Floyd, and then I found that he's a raging anti-Semite. Fuck that guy. I can't listen to his shit anymore. So those are small examples. With the Vince thing, and we don't know what else is going to come out, but you have to think more is going to come out. It becomes tougher. Any TNT, he's the host of TNT acting like Mr. Proper. He was the host of the Saturday morning show, Saturday night's main event too, Monday Night Raw for a number of years. And just wacky segments, wacky humor, wacky personality. And eventually, like I said, making out with women and doing wacky things on his show. It's going to be tough for a lot of people to watch that when he gets, if he gets convicted of something. If there's a trial and they find him guilty of rape. If any of these things happen, how are you going to ever watch him again comfortably? And how does WWE present their history? How do you present the history of the Attitude Era? The rise Good of Austin boy. and The Rock. Because <laughs> McMahon's in the middle of that whole thing. It's a, rough, uh. it's, it's a rough thing to think about. I've been thinking a lot about it. It's like, you never expect that just someone who's all over a show is going to be accused of the worst shit ever. And this may just be the tip of the iceberg. Boy, now you bum me out. I guess we'll just have to go back to pre-1984. Let me cheer you up. Tom, tell it all. <laughs> <laughs> no, let, let's just go back before 1984 when, when everybody in the wrestling business was halfway sane and behaved themselves. Oh, yeah. Oh. Well, there you see, hey, <laughs> when you hear about shit like this going on. Again, it's different with Vince because he was Vince. I mean, it's, it's going to be a very interesting thing. You know, there have been books written about him. And every single one of them now is wildly incomplete. Anything ever written about him or talked about him is wildly incomplete because this is going to be the, the coda. This is the end of his story. It's going to be Vince either going to jail or going home in disgrace or somehow winning this trial, but a lot of people aren't going to think anything except about the accusations, or he's going to lose the trial, not go to jail, and have to pay punitive damages of $100 million for someone who he shat on. Like, this is, this is a bad ending, and it's going to taint everything that came before it. Well, we said the other day, he probably won't live long enough just chronologically to redeem himself. You know, people sooner or later always forget, this will take a little while, and he may not have that while. And you have to, the so. other thing that's, you know, it's kind of superficial with all this, but him changing his face, the plastic surgery, the dyed hair, the mustache, all the things that suddenly happened. What triggered that? He had a very distinct look his entire career, even when he went gray. He looked one way, and then all of a sudden he became a different looking person. What triggered that? I mean, again, I don't know how much that ties into all this, but you know what? It's the same period of time. No, he was setting up the insanity defense. Vincent <laughs> the Chin Higante, right? That's a instead bathrobe. Of, yeah. Instead of the bathrobe and slippers, he's shuffling around, looking like goddamn Snidely Whiplash. People obviously thought that he was demented. That's what he was going for. Now he's gonna he's gonna clear his name by pleading complete batshit insanity. You you wanna you wanna bet me, huh, Brian? Oh, I don't know if I want to take that bet. I can't. You wanna uh, bet me? I don't feel comfortable either way taking that bet. No. What what are the odds on that? Can we look up the DraftKings sports book and get the odds on that? Are they taking odds on whether Vince is declared batshit insane 
in court on DraftKings yet. Not yet, but they are the official betting partner of the Jim Cornette Experience, so maybe in the future. Well, and they are the official betting partner of the Super Bowl. Super Bowl LVIII. How many is that? LVIII, that's 53. Well, I think it's more than that, isn't it? If the L comes before the V, does that subtract or add to? I think it's 58. 58. Oh, 58. You're right. 58. 58. Yeah. Well, fuck those Romans. They should just put the numbers down. But I'll tell you what, they're the official betting partner, not the Romans, but DraftKings Sportsbook of the Super Bowl and all the other bowl, the Super Bowl, the Toilet Bowl, the Orange Bowl, whatever the case. DraftKings Sportsbook has you covered because right now, if, if you take the code down, get your pens and paper ready, ladies and gentlemen, to write this down. I'm going to give you a code how you can New customers over at the DraftKings Sportsbook can bet $5 on the Super Bowl and turn it into $200 instantly in the bonus bets. And some rules may apply, so you need to read about this. But right now, just go and download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use the code JCE. You bet $5 if you're a new customer, $200 instantly in bonus bets. Here's what I would do. What I would do is I would take a third of that money and bet on one team, a third of that money and bet on the other team, and a third of that money and bet on a draw. Do they do draws in football, Brian? They don't do draws, and also I don't think you should be giving anyone betting advice, but this is the big game. This is the one that everyone's been waiting for, the Chiefs and the 49ers. Who do you think's going to win? Well, is he a minor 49er? Dreadful sorry, Clementine? Is, are the Kansas City Chiefs, is Wahoo still playing for the Chiefs? No, Wahoo played for the Jets, and uh, did he oh, play for the I Chiefs? Was, I don't think he played for the Chiefs, did he? Maybe it was Ernie Ladd. Well, if Ernie Ladd and Wahoo's playing, I'm I'm betting on that team. But right now, you just, you download that app, and you do that thing where you get that money, and you, and you bet on, I was thinking, if you just bet one way, the other way, and in the middle, then you'd come out pretty much ahead no matter what you did but it's up to you brian you want to turn my advice down just because i'm looking at this from a pragmatic sensible point of view as any good quality gambler should if you're going to be wagering you should examine all sides of this thing get your parents permission before placing the bet but anyway you can get you can get 200 bucks extra if you bet five dollars seems to me like it'd be worth it what the fuck yeah, how long? You only live once, right? Uh, how low can depends. you go? All those other sayings. Uh, uh, was that a question? I don't know what that was. I don't was. know. Uh, for the record, Wahoo played for the Houston Oilers, the Denver Broncos, the New York Jets, and the Miami Dolphins. Well, there you go. See? And his grandfather fought with Grant at Richmond. And then he fought with Custer at the Little Bighorn. He couldn't get along with anybody. But anyway, folks, once again, bet $5, get $200. Bonus bets only on the DraftKings Sportsbook, the official sports betting partner of Super Bowl 58. See, here it's written out. Before, in red letters, they had the L-V-I-I-I. That's what was confusing. But nevertheless, there's 58 of them. And if, if you hurry up and bet now and make it a big success, they'll do another one next year. The crown is yours, folks. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or in West Virginia that has to stand out all by itself and cause me to read even more copy. Visit www.1800gambler.net. One state has its own fucking 800 number for this specific problem. In New York, well, here's another one. Call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY-467-369. You can't text in West Virginia. They don't have that technology yet. In Connecticut... Help is available for problem gambling. If you're having a problem gambling, they'll come over, pick you up, and take you to the casino. No, that's not what that means. That is exactly no. not what that means. Well, call 888-789-7777 to find out. Sounds like a slot machine paying off. They're going to trigger people. Or you can visit ccpg.org. That's in Russia. Please play responsibly. On the behalf of Boot Hill, Boot Hill Casino, Boot Hill casino Boot Hill. And Resort. <laughs> Boot Hill, Kansas. They bury people there with their boots on. He died with his boots on. Stunk to high heaven did his feet. 
21 plus age varies by jurisdiction void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours and 15 minutes after issuance. See dkng.com slash football for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. <sighs> Period. That's right. DraftKings, the official betting partner of the Jim Cornette Experience. While I get my oxygen tank fired up over here, can you tell the people what's going on over at the Arcadian Vanguard Network this fine week? Oh, another <laughs> fine packed week. Another fine week of, uh... And even some of this. Well, that sounds like shit. Another fine week of packing. The Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. Get information on Facebook at facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. Or, of course, we're on Twitter at Super Podcasts. This week on Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian Solomon, a look through the archives. Brian plays an old interview he conducted with Bruno San Martino. Hear this. Great stuff. SUAWpod.com. Look for Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian Solomon. Wherever you find your favorite podcast, Stick to Wrestling with John McAdam, continues their look at 40 years ago, Vince McMahon's national expansion. Hear this today at McAdamPod.com or look for Stick to Wrestling with John McAdam wherever you find your favorite podcast. Don't forget about the wrestling news each and every day for free. Get your wrestling news, the morning wrestling newscast from the WrestlingNews.com directly or look for Arcadian Vanguard's The Wrestling News wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And of course, the 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership! Hey, go through the archive at 605pod.com, available wherever you find your favorite podcasts, The Mothership. All right, well, before we talk about the big news, because that's always behind the scenes, not on television, we got to talk about what they showed us on television, because that leads into the big news. Smackdown on February 2nd from Birmingham, Alabama. Ah, oh, Boimingham. I remember Boimingham. It was one of our better towns. And now the SmackDown announce team is Corey Graves and Wade Barrett. So they're a two-man team there, uh, as well as uh, with Cole and McAfee on Raw. And also we said goodbye to Panting Patrick. <sighs> What did you think? You said there are going to be two heels, but uh, Graves can be straight. Graves can be straight. I think he did an all right job. There's too much Michael Cole in what he does. Uh, you could tell who he's been trained by, like the hand movements and all this shit. Yeah. <laughs> too much of that fakery. But other than that, I thought they did well together. And I mean, you know, he's he's going to probably get better moved into that position now because it's... He didn't really need to be a, a color guy. I know he has the wrestling background, but that is ever farther in the in the past and people know him more as a as a commentator now and he's he's young he's he's got the hip with it look the cool kids you know he's probably got the fucking penny in his loafer and everything Corey graves i don't know if i would say he has the cool kids look or anything well he looks younger than fucking jim ross and gordon soley and lance russell and me for example well you may have a point there yeah yeah, see, but if I comb my hair right, nobody will notice. Anyway, so the first segment was Logan Paul, the in-ring promo. I continue to, every week, be a bigger fan of Logan fucking Paul. What a natural heel he is. He's got the attitude, the inflections, the facials while he's speaking. And he's got the material. You know, he's this is his shit. The writers didn't say didn't tell him to say that Kevin Owens looks like a pissed off donut, right? And you know, he's so he's so good with this. He's a personality. And the crowd started whatting him and he made it work and worked it in to where they were working with him without even knowing it, but he got booze at the end of it. Did you notice that? I did. He does a great job. Yeah, so he just and just went with it and turned it around on him. Just, boom, just backhand, right back at you. And of course, then Kevin Owens' music plays, and here he comes, and he got a big reaction. And Owens, you know, a, a less glib babyface could get slaughtered by Logan Paul, but he holds his own. And he still wants the U.S. title, but Logan Paul's say, hey, you got your shot, one and only, I outsmarted you. 
you know, fuck that, no rematch, and I'm going to go find a real challenger. And then I'm going to go down here and talk smack about you on color. And so basically, Logan Paul gets out of the ring. They go to the break, but Owens is going to have a match with Austin Theory, our boy Austin. And uh, Logan Paul's going to sit there for it. So I'm hooked on this now because I like Austin Theory and I want to hear more of Logan Paul. And Owens is there too. But this... Uh, <laughs> You know, again, they've they've fallen into Logan Paul. Who would have ever thought that he would be this good? He's one of the best performers in all of wrestling. He could do it in the ring. He could do high spots, even the ones you don't like. He could do them. He could do it on the mic. He's a natural heel. He's he's one of the best guys to come around in wrestling in a what the last ten years, fifteen yeah. years. And he started late, and he and he's a full sized grown adult. Imagine that. But anyway, um, but after that, they, they obviously, they have the match. They come back from the break, Theory and, and Owens, and they actually wrestled some. Imagine that. Theory takes a great arm drag, and they, they didn't do the two minutes to break deal on this one. They got to go five whole minutes, so you were kind of somewhat invested in it, and then Theory backdropped Owens on the apron. They went to the break. But when it came back, you know, it, it, again, it's a good WWE style match. They're not a TV match. They're not going to do too much for too long. But the theory we love and Owens we tolerate. And then finally, they did the fucking <laughs> WWF finish. Boom. As Waller draws the referee, Logan Paul hands. Theory, the brass knucks, which Owens grabs and nails Waller and then nails Theory and boom, one, two, three. And Logan Paul gets the bullshit face. And then Owens runs LP, LP, that's my abbreviation here. Owens runs Logan Paul off through the crowd. So it was a good match and a good little deal. It, it, it was, it's better than the normal lackadaisical underneath stuff they fill a lot of this TV time with. I don't know. What do you think? I thought it was all right. It was a good match. And I thought the finish was pretty clever just because it builds into everything that just happened at the Royal Rumble with the brass knucks and it tied into everything Logan Paul was saying during the promo about, you know, how he beat Kevin Owens. And Owens was admitting, yeah, the referee did a good job. They found the brass knuckles on me. <laughs> I wasn't thinking this would be something they were going to carry to WrestleMania, but it's starting to look like maybe they will. Well, and I knew from the finish at the rumble they had to do something whether it was elimination chamber wrestlemania or whatever but that did that wasn't it that wasn't it bro or whatever the kids say but then we go from some and you know that was watchable and they kept it moving and we're you're interested in the talent and then you got escobar and his group of ne'er-do-wells meeting in a crowded restaurant again why why are they being filmed in crowded restaurants, Brian? Oh, I don't know. I don't. They needed a, a <laughs> meal and a drink. <laughs> I needed a drink after trying to watch this. I don't. How then, many camera angles or how many camera cuts were there? There were, are four people at a table. You would yeah. think one camera, but there was a camera on each guy's face or, and a woman's face too. Every time they did anything. All that, you should see the behind-the-scenes footage of all those servers trying to get past all those camera people and technicians in order to deliver the food to the tables surrounding. It was very inconsiderate. And then speaking of he's, inconsiderate... He's good, I, I like Escobar. I Escobar I like, I, I, I like Escobar. I think he's good. It, uh, he's, but he's not goddamn the cartel boss. You know, this is not believable shit that they're... It's just they're sitting in a restaurant being dramatic in, in an unbelievable way. Well, yeah. Yeah. All righty. And then in the unbelievable part of things, we had a three-way tag team match with Purely Dreary against Butch and Bait. I'm sorry, that's Dunn and Bait now. And uh, sounds like a companion magazine to Field and Stream, Dunn and Bait. And they were against the LWO. Yeah, Butch, and, your Butch and Bay may be a different magazine altogether, too. Butch and Bay. Well, 
<laughs> what were your thoughts on the three-way tag team match? I, you know, I kind of just went to the finish. I hate the multi. Yeah. I thought it was a four-way tag match, actually. Was there more? I think there was a fourth tag team in there. I may have missed that. And I just kind of went to the finish. I wasn't uh, too interested. What was the finish? I don't remember, but but done in bait one. <laughs> done in bait one. That's the finish. Well, that's what I mean. Who won? Yeah. We finally got to nine o'clock is what happened. And here comes Bailey's bunch, damage control for the in-ring interview and Bailey to celebrate winning the Women's Royal Rumble. And who she is she going to pick Ripley? Everybody, she's going to pick Rhea Ripley. Everybody's thinking it. And who's the other girl that's not, that wasn't there? Dakota, Dakota Kai. Kai. Yeah, she wasn't there. Where'd she go? I don't know. They didn't even say anything, did they? They didn't mention her. Well, they mentioned yeah. her in the promo, but they didn't say, like, she's not here. Well, they that, that's where they didn't mention why she wasn't there. Could it be that she had knowledge that something was going to go down and didn't need to pick a side or didn't want to pick a side? She wanted to be neutral. Plausible deniability. Well, you know what? That is interesting because it does give you another segment. Well, whose side is she on? But as far as this segment goes, I thought this was really well done. Well, it, actually... <laughs> I've got to agree with you because what they've been building up is the other girls, especially EO Sky and Carrie Sane and Oscar, the Kabuki Warriors, they've all got history. They've all been together for a long time, have known each other. Bailey's kind of been the odd woman out in the thing. But now Bailey comes out and she's dressed all in white, very subliminal. Uh, you'll you'll recall when Paulie clocked me over the head with the phone, I was dressed in a great variety of white clothing. She's a baby face now, and the people are cheering for her, and Pierce and Aldous are in the ring. Who's she going to pick for the blah, 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 women's title match? And she does this promo, which and she can talk. That's a, I just... Remember what I said? She could be a great manager like J.J. for the Four Horsemen when she transitions out of her wrestling career. It's just that she's the biggest girl on this team by far. I'm not into her compadres and cohorts, but nevertheless, she did the promo. She had her girls' support going into WrestleMania. She would many times cry, it's not going like I want it to, and they'd be there for her. They were like family. And the other three are making fun of her behind her back, but when she turns around, they straighten up like kids in class, right? And they're laughing and pointing. And she leads up to be the absolute best. I have to beat one of the best. I don't know why you wouldn't have to beat the best, but nevertheless. That brings me to Rhea Ripley. And they're doing it again behind her. And she turns around and she says, or I could fight a different fight. Sometimes it's more personal. People you thought were your friends, sometimes you have to prove them wrong. And at this point, she's doing a good promo and they're doing the standard heel stuff. But the really, the thing that put it over for me and, and got me into it, she walks up to him and speaks Japanese. And in their faces, the eyes get big as pie plates because she's like, yeah. I picked it up from all of you talking behind my back. So there's the reveal. She knows what they've been doing. That was fucking great. That was so well yeah. done. Their facial reactions when she revealed she knows Japanese was great. Yeah, and, and then she blistered them for talking about her. And she wanted to do all these things together with them. But EO, since the others came around, you know, it's not you and me anymore, blah, blah, blah. And then the other girls jumped Bailey from behind. And they hammer and she's down, but as they're celebrating, and this don't say, what the fuck? Bailey reaches behind the ring steps and comes out with a fake lead pipe. And I know it's a fake lead pipe because she hit the girls enough that they would have had internal injuries if it was a real lead pipe. But why is a lead pipe leaned up behind the stairs? Obviously, Bailey had it set up there, knowing that she was going to get hit and be in that corner and able to reach down and just grab it. That's what they would like people to think like, wouldn't they? That's the only thing you could, yeah. could believe, right? Well, anyway, point being, a uh, good segment. Now it's going to be Bailey and EO Sky at WrestleMania. 
I could have done without the lead pipe. Certainly, to God, she, you know, we could have done something else besides a fake lead pipe, but I'm being picky. I thought this was a really good segment, having Rhea in the back watching the monitor, added a little bit to it because you didn't know which way she would go. And then the reveal of she speaks Japanese, watching the other girl's faces drop. Io Sky, I thought, was great in this with her facial reactions because she didn't expect any of this. And great. Se- I'm trying to remember, what was the last time we saw a women's promo segment that was this good? It's been a while. Yeah, no, this was great. I like this. And and actually, it was one woman doing the promo and the other one's reacting. But, you know, that's the thing. And, and Bailey, knowing how to speak Japanese, Brian, you know how she did that, don't you? Do I know how she... I have no idea how she did that, no. Well, you know, the, all the talent, the men and the women, they spend a lot of downtime in the airports and the, the, the bus terminals and <laughs> looking for their shuttle bus to the hotel in the hotel rooms. Bailey got one of those unlimited wireless plans and she's been studying Japanese in the privacy of when she had private moments specifically so that she could know that these other three were about to stab her in the back. That's one of the things you can do when you pay almost nothing for unlimited data. Have you heard about this? I have not heard about this, but it sounds like she needs a good phone plan. Well, that's the thing. You're going to get the good phone plan along with the unlimited data as long as you're going to Mint Mobile. That's why they call it Mint Mobile, because they're going to save you a mint. And then you'll find a mint on your pillow in the hotel when you're, you got plenty of data on your phone. And you're sitting there and don't know whether to wind your ass or scratch your watch. Just get on your phone and learn Japanese. Or get on your phone and call Japan, because you get unlimited talk and text with Mint Mobile plus the high-speed data. So you can learn to speak Japanese probably, what, three or four days with the data being high-speed? Well, no, that seems rather quick. I think it would take more time than that, to be honest. Well, no, things move quickly in today's modern technologically marveled world. Right, doesn't mean and, you'll maintain the data in your head that quickly. Well, you'll have it right on your phone, so just tell your phone to talk to these Japanese people. And it'll do it at a high rate of speed. It'll sound like a Japanese auctioneer. Macarena, whatever the fuck. Because all your plans at Mint Mobile, whether it be three, six, or 12 months, they give you the best rate whether you're buying for one or a family. Families start at two lines, by the way. So if you get two lines, that means you're a family. If you get a line and... Some, I don't know, some guy across the street that you don't know gets a line. Well, you guys are now related. And you can probably cash in on his social security when he's gone. But anyway, right now, if you switch to Mint Mobile, you can get your first three months of premium wireless service starting at just $15 a month. And that's the unlimited everything. You can, my God, you can call Bolivia and speak for hours and they're, they're stuck with the bill. It's a Just fuck with them. Just call people you don't even know in foreign countries. Folks, to get your new wireless plan for just $15 a month to get the plan shipped to your door for free, I guess it's written down on paper and it'll come in a plain brown wrapper. Go to mintmobile.com slash JCE. Mintmobile.com slash JCE. Cut the wireless bill to 15 bucks a month. Know all the knowledge there is to know in the world and talk to anybody that you want to talk to wherever, even if they don't want to talk to you. Also, if you call from a Mint Mobile number, they have to answer. If they don't, their phone gives them a slight electric shock. That's technically not true, but it's a nice thought. It could happen. It will. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions may apply, but not to some of you because you make your own rules because you're renegades that way. Once again, Mint Mobile. Yes. A fine solution for all of your mobile needs. What's that promo code, Jim? That's uh, the promo code is JCE, and they are certainly a fine solution. One of the the only solution you're going to need. They'll solve everything for you. They'll get to the bottom of it, root these things out, drain the swamp. It's becoming very popular. We've heard from some listeners that have uh, enjoyed Mint Mobile so far, or enjoyed their plans, or getting on Mint yes. Mobile, whatever. How and their mints. And they're mints. Because they, you can take these mints with you anywhere because they're mobile. Well, there are no physical mints, for the record. I thought you every time you sign up, don't you get mints? No. You uh, don't get any mints, ever. Somebody sent me mints. Really? 
I just had one of them. I felt kind of ill afterwards. That wasn't from Mint Mobile. I was smelling the burnt toast after I took it Some for some reason. Burnt toast? I don't know. Anyway, continuing on with SmackDown. What was the deal with... <sighs> What's the deal, Jerry? Bobby Lashley and the Street Profits and Karrion Cross and the Age of Pain or the... Uh, the Final Testament. The Friends of Distinction. What the is their Friends name? Friends of Distinction. What are they? I like the Friends of Distinction. I can dig it, no. he can dig it, she can dig it, we can dig it, you can dig it, they can dig it. Oh, it did. Yeah. Yeah, that's good stuff. Can you dig it, baby? Well, we're, we're grazing in the grass trying to figure out what the authors of pain. <laughs> the authors of pain and Karrion Cross and Lashley and the Prophets, they came out to the ring. They got in a big sloppy six-way fucking fight. Scarlet jumped up on Bobby Lashley's back, trying to claw at his eyes, and that's when returning from beyond the pale or wherever the fuck she's been, B-Fab. Remember, she was the female cohort of Flop Dollar and Swerve before they got canned the first time and he went to Greener Pastures and the other guy. And she got Scarlet off of Lashley and looked very confused about what else she should do. And... They all ran off, and it was over in two minutes. Was it supposed to be a match? Was somebody coming out? What the fuck happened here? I have to go back and watch it. I hate to say it. I fast-forwarded when I saw who was in it, just because nothing's really happening with any of this. I didn't know B-Fab was going to be there. I would have watched. But it was over so quick. It was like, something we've done is run long. We don't have time to have the match. Just go out and do the finish. I There was no... I, I don't think it started, so I don't think it was ever over. They just fought and then quit fighting. After B Fab saved Lashley from Scarlet. And Scarlet was quite upset. She did give a damn, I'll tell you that. She looks good with the uh, brunette hair. I'm not I'm not digging it. I'm digging it. You can dig it, but I can't dig it. But she can dig it. Dig it, dig it. Can you dig it? Oh, let's dig it. Baby. So then we go to the back again. I'm sorry. No, she looks too dark now. She had the, 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 the blonde. She had the Marilyn Monroe thing going on. Now it's just like. Eva Gardner. Eh, I don't know which, whether she's a gardener or not. That's How many wrestling podcasts this week will mention Joan Crawford, Ava Gardner, and Marilyn Monroe in one show? And the Friends of Distinction. And the Friends of Distinction. I don't think any of them. God damn it. That's why we're on top. <laughs> So in the back, Nick Aldis was making Braun Breaker an offer, smart man, but Adam Pierce comes in, and he said, well, no, you got to talk to me on Monday. I'll give you a better deal than that. And so Braun said, I'll, I'll think about it, Mr. Aldis, and Mr. Pierce, I'll see you on Monday. So at least we're going to get to see him sooner than later. Well, they have in, to bring in, him up in to the, the big main time. They have to bring him up to the main roster now. There's no reason not to. Yeah, I mean, Jesus Christ. Look at some of the things they're showing us right now. And here's this fucking future WrestleMania main eventer, as long as The Rock approves. So <laughs> anyway, then as Braun leaves, Jane Cargill comes in to talk to Nick Aldis. And uh, did you catch Adam Pierce calls Aldis double O salesman? <laughs> I did catch that. I love their interaction. I'm a big fan of Nick Aldis so far. And he's brought out the best at Adam Pierce. Yeah, well, because Adam's got somebody to talk to that he can do something with rather than just telling guys what their matches are and arguing with them and shit. See, I like Nick Aldis because you can't figure out what his motivation is. Sometimes he's like right down the middle, straight laced, and sometimes it feels like he's not. And he's got these issues with Adam Pierce, who's like Mr. Nice Guy in terms of how he's portrayed on the show. I'm intrigued by all this. Yeah, see, that, if Aldis is a cutthroat businessman out for himself, and if what's best for the company and or the TV show is, is best for him, if he does it, that type of thing. But then what wasn't best for the television program was Tiffany Stratton versus Mia Yim. Did I miss anything? I had to uh, belch. I wasn't feeling well. That's right. You had uh, you had a severe attack of the hooping belch about this time of night, didn't you? Around this time of night, yeah. Yeah. It's a regular thing. I think it comes from too much fucking potassium. 
But anyway, now we got to the main event of the evening, which was another interview, obviously. But at 9.37 p.m. Eastern, I clocked it, Roman Reigns began making his entrance with Paul Heyman and Solo and Jimmy Uso. And I know he's a big star. And I know that the entrance is the pomp and pageantry of the thing. Guess what time, how long from the time the entrance started till he spoke his first word, Brian, guess the time elapsed. Six minutes. You are incorrect. Only four and a half. Oh. Four and a half minutes later, he spoke his first words. And then we acknowledged him, and then he moved on. And this was brilliant in a number of ways, what he did, because he said, we got to address some of the things that were said on Monday. My little brother, Seth Rollins, and nobody reacted. And then he said, that, that's right, no pop. <laughs> God, that was man. something. How about that? Oh, my God. Man, don't throw rocks at a man carrying a machine gun, Seth. And I hate that the writers probably told him to say most of those things, but he was wholeheartedly with it. But apparently it didn't get over on the island of relevancy out there in the, the, the South Pacific. But he said, Seth Rollins says he's got the title, the title, the blah, blah. He's, Roman calls it the loser bracket title. I beat all those guys that are contending for that. He told the truth that here's the heel teller. And it was devastating to the case they made on raw. It was obviously what everybody was thinking. Cause we said a lot of these same things, but uh, so they, they have a guy say something on Monday, not on purpose. And then have the other guy come out and just fucking destroy him on Friday. And he said he runs around for two years in his wife wife's clothing and calls himself the guy. Well, yeah, I work 10 times less than you and I make 10 times more money. You people want Seth Rollins money or tribal chief money? Oh, my God. Stop it. He's already dead. Just and the toe of the boot just kept kicking him. And you wondered about those comments that Rollins made about him on Monday night. Like, wow, those are a little hard there. Yes. And that's, and this is, that was the perfect receipt. And this is, uh, <laughs> so anyway, he says, so Cody can do whatever he wants to do. Cause he's got values. It may, it may not all be about the money with Cody Rhodes. So Cody can either be the very best number two in the world or take another crack at number one. And I mean, let's just stop there before we go any further. Good Lord, they again, nobody was going to buy Seth's line of goods that he was trying to sell on Raw, except if you were the like the AEW style fan that's like, oh yeah, he has great matches because it was just bullshit and it was made up and you couldn't get behind it. I didn't think they were going to just disembowel and fucking what's circumcise or what's the word I'm searching for? Neuter? Uh, cut the balls off of Seth Rollins so verbally, but I think Roman may have been just a tad bit personally offended. It's kind of like when Lawler got hot, when Jimmy Hart said, what do you do with a horse when he breaks his leg? You shoot him. Did you see the video? I forget when it aired on this show, but it was Cody and Seth Rollins. It was Rollins doing commentary, talking about the various champions of the NWA and the WWE. Once again, do you want to be the Hulk Hogan champion or the Ric Flair champion, the Dusty Rhodes champion? All of a sudden, they had a Ric Flair montage. I was like, what is this? <laughs> and I stopped the fast forward to see it. And it was all building up that promo. It was well, referring to that promo, I guess. And see, they're, they're being too smart for their own good and that they're, uh, they can't build up the secondary title, uh, especially while Seth is the first and only owner, uh, only owner, first and only owner of it. It's not going to be nearly as big or as important to the fans or anybody else as the ones ones that Roman Reigns are wearing or is wearing or whatever the goddamn grammar is. So they're just tearing down their big one trying to build up their little one, aren't they? Who knows? Well, anyway, 
when he said you want to be the very best number two or take another crack at number one cody music and he gets a big pop and he makes his entrance and they go to the break in the middle of an interview segment because it's already been going about eight minutes and they got a lot more to go but the the cliffhanger is who is cody rhodes going to choose when he comes back or when we come back and they come back three and a half minutes later and the music's still playing and Cody's just now stepping in the ring. So he must have stopped to have a coffee or whatever. And the big Cody chance. And boy, howdy, they're ready to see this fucking thing. And he asks Roman, can we have the ring to ourselves? And Paul and Solo and Uso step out. And that's when Cody tells the story. I took counsel this week. I talked to family and friends and legends. And Seth has made great points in his argument, but I disagree. It's not the Hollywood title. It's the title that my daddy had in his hands, and that's the title I still want. And everybody thinks, oh, here we go. And then Cody says that Roman, you say all of this is yours. So finishing my story is taking everything away from you. And I want that title, and I'm coming for it because I want everything, but not at WrestleMania. And that's when people kind of go, what? Even Roman was surprised. Yes. And... He says, I took counsel from one individual that I talked to that knows you very well. And boom, the Rock's music hits. And Roman's face <laughs> changes. And, and in a realistic way, not a <laughs> way. And the place goes batshit. And here comes the Rock. And now, by the way, The Rock's music starts playing at 9.52 p.m. SmackDown goes off the air at 9.58 because they're on network time. And nothing else was said. Rock makes his entrance, shakes hands with Cody. They hug. He whispers something in Cody's ear. Cody smiles. And then leaves, turns back and nods, sort of like a he ain't heavy, he's my brother, look back. And Rock does the slowly I turn to Roman and the music comes down and the Rocky chants go. And he does the face-off with Roman. First, they're all the way across the ring and they get a little closer, a little closer, a little closer. And finally, as they're about six inches from nose to nose, we go off the air. So the last six minutes on the air, nobody spoke. It would just, but that's the thing is we'll dissect in a moment the logic of it or the reasons for it or the potential backlash from it or whatever the case. But what a fucking two segment piece of business here. If you just want to talk about making people go batshit about something in the building, in the room, in the moment. Well, part of it, well, part of it is that they've stacked it so that the rock gets these kind of reactions because he keeps coming out as a surprise. The surprise pop is different than the advertised pop. Yes. I th I'm swallowing still. I thought you were going some uh, further with no, that, but I mean, every appearance he's made recently, it's a surprise appearance when all of a sudden his music hits and people react to it. Yeah, but if it's Tits McGee and the music plays, people are going to fucking throw goddamn fucking stale jelly donuts at him. He's still a star to get the, oh shit, it's him. Right. I mean, I'm sure the people in Birmingham didn't expect The Rock to show up. No, that wasn't, that wasn't part of the, uh, the advertised program. They didn't realize how desperate he is. But the, <laughs> see, you're going to... I'm I'm being neutral because I see both sides of this thing, and you could have bigger troubles than what they've got as far as, oh, goddamn, which major star do we put in this main event that sold 100,000 tickets already live? But, but this, as, as a performance, 
Roman was fantastic here. And then Cody, he's over, and they want to see it, and they've got him to where they want to see it. And I thought he performed this well, even though that it is on the face of it, the surface of it, we don't understand why he made this decision. We do because we know the backstage news and the out of the ring news, but just on the television but presentation. In yeah, in kayfabe, it makes no in sense. In kayfabe, well, it could, I'm going to tell you in a minute how it could eventually, but right now it doesn't make a lot of sense to the average fan. Go, well, we wanted to see you do it. And we like The Rock, but we, you, you know. So the segment was great. It, and it, it, you know, they've been doing ratings on SmackDown when you get star after star after star. Last week was almost two and a half million people. I'm pretty sure this one, when the numbers come out, will be a, a big number and probably massive at the end. Because you, at the very least, even if Rock was a surprise, you knew that Cody and Roman were in the in the middle of the ring face-to-face. -face. So they're doing big numbers for this, and it was a good segment on the program. But, but, lots of people are upset. Because, and remember last year, we were pissed off because Cody didn't win. Because I thought, ah, oh, fuck, but they have managed to make it better, I think. I didn't think they'd do it, but the people want to see it more now than they ever have. But at some point, will they tamper with this, you know, one too many times? Or delay it, or milk it, or whatever? Yeah, this, was the, this was the one too many times based on the reaction outside of that arena from wrestling fans all across the world so far. Well, and, and let's talk about that for a second, because before we get into the, the uh, business office aspect of things, just what the fans have done, how many hundred thousand tweets did hashtag we want Cody get in a day or whatever? Well, it's been a day, I think, or a day and a half, but as we are recording right now, Sunday, 335,000 tweets. <laughs> <laughs> we want Cody. And for the record, I saw We Want Rocky was also a, a trending earlier, but that was only, I think, 12,000 tweets. Ouch. That's a hell of a ratio right there. <laughs> well, but, you know, here is the thing. Before we go any further with talking about what we really know and what might actually happen, when I saw this and I started thinking about this, I said they could eventually do it like this. I'm not saying they're going to. I don't know if they're going to. They probably won't. But would it be something that they would have set and thought and said this will work to have their cake and eat it too and have both of these matches? You can't deny that The Rock is a major Hollywood celebrity and with Peacock now having more subscribers than ever, people that might not watch a wrestling event at this point. Oh shit, Rock's wrestling is Samoan cousin in the main event of this big spectacular fucking show that we can see with our peacock prescription or sub prescription yeah. subscription also they're not even cousins in any way well what you but you know what i'm saying for the average person they ain't watching this show because regardless of what they want to say about how mad they are the people that are really into the wwe are watching wrestlemania especially since it don't cost a hundred dollars anymore to order two pay-per-views that right there you just hit the nail on the head what the problem is the problem is WWE did something that would appeal more to non-fans than the actual weekly viewers. And what they did, I think based on the reaction we've seen so far, and this is what I expected, it has upset the viewers because you're taking yes. something away from them that they've been waiting for, for really no good reason. Tickets are already sold. Well, it's, but no, it's not it's even something, about the tickets anymore. Right, again, you brought up Peacock. It's something they think is going to appeal to people outside of wrestling, not wrestling fans. And I think that's always a dangerous road to go down, trying to appeal to the casuals or whatever you want to call well, them. Well, but some, sometimes it works. When they shaved, they thought they were going to shave either Trump's or Vince's head. They shaved Vince's. That worked. Biggest pay-per-view ever, yeah. And The Rock is certainly... Uh, a bigger deal, not only to the wrestling audience, but the movie audience and whatever. 
But he's done. But, he's not the big deal now that he was in 2013 when he came back. Well, but the, the point I'm making is, is this an idea that they may could have sold themselves on that this will work? Because what happens every time anybody is built up to face Roman Reigns? In the big match, the rest of the bloodline comes down, and either because it's no DQ and they can, they kick the shit out of somebody, or if not, they fucking wipe the referee out, and there are people been in fucking medically induced comas that come around quicker than the referee, and they beat the shit out of whoever the guy is challenging Roman, and he wins, right? That's it every time. So, what about if if Roman and Rock, this match I can't see being for the title, wouldn't be for the title, I wouldn't have it for the title if I was doing this. If I was in this position and I was going to get out of it, I would have the Rock versus Roman Reigns is the main event of night two of the biggest WrestleMania of all time and get all that publicity and all the peacocks and all that stuff and Netflix would just be just tickling themselves on their taint and all that. But Cody Rhodes is the one that stops all of the interference from any member of the bloodline personally on the spot so that The Rock, in a non-title match for the tribal chief position defeats Roman Reigns because of Cody making the playing field even when he, Rock was about to suffer the same fate as everybody else has. And then there's Cody to hold the Rock's hand up. And then the Rock, as tribal chief, is the first one to lay down the goddamn proclamation that Solo and Uso and any other member of the bloodline is not allowed to assist Roman Reigns from now on. He has to win his battles himself. The only one that doesn't abide by The Rock, the new tribal chief's rules, is Paul Heyman because he's not only not really blood, he's also a fucking conniving shyster crook con man. And so Roman has only Heyman as an ally over the next two or three months leading up to SummerSlam, where at that point, Cody Rhodes gets his opportunity to finish his story. He's taken away the bloodline. He's taken away the support system. He's taken away all of Roman Reigns' improper advantages, and now he's going to take the title. And The Rock could even be the special referee or whatever the fuck. But at the point that Roman Reigns suffers his loss for the championship, totally at the hands of Cody Rhodes, that's when Heyman stabs him in the fucking back, and Roman Reigns comes back as a babyface. Does that get him out of it? No. No? I don't think so. <laughs> I, I think people are going to be then upset. Then nothing can get him out of it. I think, first of all, I think if it's Rocky versus Roman at WrestleMania, Roman has to win. Because it doesn't help the company for The Rock to win that match. First of all, The Rock's going to come out of that match needing multiple surgeries for injuries. I'll bet on that now. He's going to be fucked up after one match. And we're not wishing on anyone. I'm not be. wishing it on him, but I'm we're saying... A if, you, of it. if you look at his previous matches over the last 15 years, and you look at everyone else who comes back after a time off, and he's 51 or whatever, and he's bigger than he naturally should be, he's going to get hurt. And he's not the guy you want as your champion. They've spent all this time building up Roman Reigns. It's worked. He's got to beat Rocky. That puts him over bigger than ever. That stuns the Rock. Let's see if he can really act. Show us how upset you are about that. <laughs> and then you get something with Cody. Now, it should be at WrestleMania. It's stupid that it wouldn't be. This isn't like something you want to see at a backlash or something. It takes away all the pomp and circumstance of 80,000 people and fireworks and everything. Do you, think it's, do you think it's a double bad whammy if they don't get to see Cody beat Roman, but at the same time, Rock doesn't beat Roman? I think they're going to have to play their cards perfectly for fans not to turn on Dwayne Johnson because we're about to be inundated with his crap. His daughter all of a sudden is on NXT as the general manager. Despite no one thinking she has any specific abilities as a promo, as an on-camera personality, 
I think she tried out to be a wrestler or something. That didn't work. Well, now uh, hold up. We'll uh, we'll examine his auxiliary crew here that he's bringing in in a second. But just staying on The Rock and Roman, I don't see how they're going to get away with not giving the people Cody and Roman and then having Roman Reigns beat The Rock at the and leave WrestleMania with, uh uh-huh, he did it again. Now, again, maybe there are creative ways around that. I'm not saying I would necessarily do this, but maybe Cody beats Damian Priest and gets the money in the bank suitcase. Again, that's kind of a lame way to get around it. Maybe Cody wins Elimination Chamber and somehow could pick something from that. I don't know. All right, how about this? How about this? How about if Cody is, if the match is for the title with Rock and Roman and Cody helps the Rock win the title and then we get the Rock and Cody for the title and Cody beats the Rock. Uh, unless you, if you want Dwayne Johnson to be booed, yeah, that's a great idea. Well, I'm just trying to get out of this that they've got into now. Well, let's go back a step. Cody and Roman was built up for WrestleMania last year. Everyone thought Cody was going to win. Cody lost. Fans were upset. We were told by Paul Heyman and Triple H and everyone, give it time. These are the early innings. The story still has to be told. And in that year, Cody is more over today than he was then. Yeah. Cody's the most over babyface in wrestling right now. And everyone knows that this is the, everyone knows this is the match they expected especially when he won the Rumble, and it feels like it's being yanked away. We've seen this before. Brian Danielson, you know, when they eventually put him in that three-way match with what, Batista and Triple H, and he won. The fans kind of went crazy demanding it. I think we're going to have a problem now because Dwayne Johnson's not going to always be able to show up and get a surprise pop. And the fans and the chatter about this is getting louder and louder because it feels like for the first time in a real long while, WWE is like slapping the face of the fans with this. The reaction's been overwhelming. They did not expect it. Most disliked video in WWE YouTube (laughs) history. To the point where someone just wrote to me, I have to check on this. They said they just put it up again a second time, but they cut out Cody's sad facial expressions. (laughs) So I need to go and check out if that's a real thing. Wait, they they replaced it with a shot of Cody playing with his baby and he's smiling. (laughs) The Rock just started showing up he gets put on the board of directors, given a ridiculous pay package. Nick Khan's his friend from childhood. Ari Emanuel's people have been representing him for years. And now all of a sudden, he's jumping right into the main event of this show that he wasn't needed for. I mean, that's the other thing. It's a kumbaya moment. The locker room gets along. They're doing great business, record business. Everything's working out fine. And then he's throwing himself right in the middle of it. And the word going around is that he was politicking for it. The other word going around is that he was politicking to win. So who knows? But this is a locker room morale crushing thing for someone who is a massive star from the past to come in and just take the spot on top when it's not needed, it's not necessary, and it may be counterproductive long term to everything they've been building and working on. And he's just going to be slotted in there. Brian, I can explain to you why this happened. And I can also explain to you why you're so upset about this, why you're so incensed about this, because you're not listening to enough pleasant music. What? That's You're not listening to enough pleasant music. That isn't true. I listen to so much pleasant music every single no, day. No, you need to listen guy. to some Carpenters. What? No. You need to no. listen. To, you need to listen to some of the Archies, a little Bang Shang Alang. Oh, the Archies. Bang Bang. I, I like the Archies. That's stuff. how my heart went. I like Bubble. You Bubble. need to put your Raycon wireless earbuds in. You need to shut out the outside world, and you need to listen to your own pleasant soundtrack, and it'll lift your mood. It'll improve your state of mind. You won't be thinking about all these scandals and backstabbing incidents and treachery and deceit and dishonor. You'll be thinking about the strawberry alarm clock and incense and peppermints. That's, because not, the, that's not really a relaxing song. Well, it, it certainly it is. 
No, it's Incense not. Incense and peppermint's the color of time. That, that's not how they sang it. That certainly is not how the record sounds in any well, way. You, you could listen to Alley Oop by the Hollywood Argyles. That's a fun, boppy song. Well, you're just all over the place. That was written by Kim Fowley, by the way. But you're it all certainly over the place. was. Well, with the Raycon Everyday Earbuds, you can be all over the place because you can listen to anything you want. You can play the soundtrack that your mind hears and imagine what kind of fucking chaos that'll be. You've got the optimized gel tips for the perfect in-ear fit. You just stick them in there and the gel instantly bonds to your skin and forms a, a permanent seal. So there's no way you're going to be able to shake or drag these things out. And, uh, you know, now the surgery for the removal of the Raycon Everyday Earbuds is cheaper than ever. It's covered by most major insurance. And your Raycons are here for not only a good time, but a long time. Much like many of your other relationships, with eight hours of playtime and a 32-hour battery life. And, Brian, you know, they've got the customizable sound profiles, three of them. The earbud tap functions, the noise isolation mode, the awareness mode. Basically, you can put these things, you can call cabs with these things. If you actually, you got the Raycon wireless earbuds in. If you put your index finger on your right hand in your right ear and you whistle with two fingers in your mouth, then it will broadcast it off the left channel to all the taxi cab companies in the area. Not true. You've There's, tried that in New York, haven't you? I have not, and it's a real bitch. And it helps also nowadays. if you're standing on one leg and hopping and waving the other arm over your head and screaming like a chicken. People will stop. Uh, sometimes it's not even a cab. It's just random people in a car will stop when they see you. None of this has anything to do with Raycon. As you said at the top, you can listen to fine tunes, some good music. You can answer your phone calls. You can listen to a podcast or a wrestling show, whatever you want. Well, imagine that. And, you know, Valentine's Day is coming up. So get your significant other a set of these bad boys and put it on the noise isolation mode. And that way you don't have to talk to them and they won't be able to hear you. So it'll it tremendously elongate your relationship. And anyway, right now, if you go to buy Raycon, that's B-U-Y-R-A-Y-C-O-N, buyraycon.com slash J-C-E, you can get 15% off so you can save money on whatever bimbo or bimbet you're buying something for for the holiday, for Valentine's Day. 15% off and free shipping. They'll bring it to the, the old hag or the miserable piece of shit that you're involved with, whichever one applies, and not charge you for shipping or the extra 15% you're going to get off the whole total. So that's a good deal, right? That's a good deal. Right. Well, if there's three or four people that you don't like in your life, you can save money and get them something where that they can't hear you and won't want to talk to you either. Well, maybe so just buy a set of these for everybody that you really just pisses you off that you don't like. Well, and don't tell want... them to shove these in their fucking ears. I don't want to discourage anyone from buying these for anyone, but let's focus on the people that you like in your life. Well, there's a lot more of them that I don't like than ones that I like. So it seems to me that Raycon's business would be enhanced if I was buying them for people that I didn't like. Because there's a ton of them. They'd sell fucking everyday earbuds out there, everyday asses. Think how many people you don't like. Yeah, I'm not buying anything for them. Think how many people you do like. I'm not spending a cent on any of these people. Well, fuck them then. Exactly. So by your own no, Raycon. Because you, you've already got your everyday earbuds, That's but other right. people don't. And nor will they with my money. Well, then you're going to have to put up with them hearing you and talking to you. Because there won't be anything to cut them off from the outside world. So your solution is to find all the people I don't like and buy them noise-canceling earbuds so I don't have to hear them? Yeah, tell them, stick these in your ears, then they won't be able to hear you and they won't want to talk to you, so you don't have to deal with them. They'll be in their own world. And then potentially, if you can get them all to wear them at the same time and broadcast some kind of, I don't know, high-frequency signal, you could fry all their brains at the same time, and they'd be goddamn just wandering around like fucking turkeys, gobbling and looking up at the sky when it rains, and they'd drown. I don't know about that. Once again, incense and peppermints, ladies and gentlemen. You can hear great tunes, relaxing tunes, whatever it may be, rock and roll, rap, everything in between with Raycon. Yes. All you have to do is go to incenseandpeppermints.com. I'm sorry, buy Raycon. Buy Raycon. That's right. Slash incense and peppermints. No, slash J C E. 
15% off and free shipping on the incense or the peppermints. But that's anyway, right. so that's, I just wanted to get that in because we're supposed to before the end of the program, but let's dissect the reasons for the rock in this whole thing and, and how I think these people are, are viewing this. Brian, because think about it. You've got Ari Emanuel, big time Hollywood muckety muck, Nick Khan childhood friend of the rock right they go way back robust friend yeah all of the 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 big executives that they either have got in this new company conglomerate tko or that they have inherited from the ufc they're used to making the biggest match in the fight game it's about making the biggest fight the star power right And I can see where no matter how popular Cody is for these people who may not be yet tuned into the the dedicated, the, the, the most loyal WWE audience just looking at it from being promoters and being dealing with celebrities. Here's The Rock. He's a fucking movie star. You can't deny it. He's been in more movies than Cody has. Yes, he has. They just... Gave him $30 million to be on the board of directors, and this is at a period of time where the company, even their new company, because of the previous administration, has never looked worse because of all the shit about Vince and Laurinaitis and whatever. And The Rock to the general public is a very popular son of a bitch. And he's on the board of directors, and they want him to have not only as the his standing as the biggest star in the recent history of wrestling, but also his celebrity and his notoriety, but in a positive fashion, how can that be bad, right? This is fucking great. This is what they're thinking. And the stories are now that The Rock, you say politic, I mean, pitched the idea, came up with this. Think about this. They thought they had Seth and Rollins, Seth and Rollins, they certainly Seth did. And, well, they had both of them. They thought they had Seth and Punk and Cody and Roman and Brock Lesnar on the card, and all of a sudden, Rollins is hurt and Punk is out, and Brock is persona non grata, can't be used. So The Rock goes in and says, well, I got the answer. I'll come back. And you know what? You can't blame not only him for pitching it, but also because he wants to be as valuable to these people as possible because they just paid him $30 million and he's got a big-time spot. And he's, as we'll talk about in a minute, he's got a good chance maybe of running this son of a bitch one of these days. And he said, well, I'll come in and save the day and we'll have this long-awaited match. And, you know, blah, 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 and they've come up with however they're going to get out of it and whatever idea they've got from there. And that's... (laughs) The UFC, as a precedent, is more like the pioneer days of wrestling, not in terms of it being a work, but in terms of the way that it was presented and promoted to the people. They didn't do angles before television. They didn't do promos before television. It To the public, wrestling, even when it was a work, was still presented as, you know, this guy's trying to build his winning streak to challenge the, the world champion. And, oh, boy, there's bad blood between these two guys because the last match they had, now they got a rematch. I mean, it was fairly bad. And that's the same thing. As we've talked about, you get with the UFC, the guys on top, the Conor McGregor's, the every once in a while, the gimmick attractions like the Diaz brothers, whatever, they get away with doing a little more trash talking and a little more promotion, but there are no... The angles are much simpler. Nobody's running over anybody with a golf cart in a fucking UFC, right? And they book big-name fighters against each other in big pay-per-view main events. So that's what Nick Khan and whoever that side of things in the TKO administration probably thinks they've done. They've booked the biggest name possible in the wrestling business to be in the main event of their biggest show. What they didn't probably expect, and because I don't think it happens this way in in 
Hollywood and it is the fans don't usually hijack the UFC events, but the most dedicated audience for the WWE and the ones that have driven this turnaround and powered their business here lately, both anti Vince and pro Cody. Cause they want to see the story finish. You can't do that in the UFC because you can't, there's that pesky little thing about we don't really know who's going to win the fucking fight when we book it. But the wrestling fans now, they know this is different. And even if they like the goddamn rock, it's a different fucking movie. They want to see the end of this movie first. So I can see both sides and I can also see the rock obviously for self-serving purposes, wanting to go in there because think about this, the fucking grandson of Peter Maivia, the son of Rocky soul man, Johnson could end up not only being at one point, the biggest star in Hollywood, but also running the goddamn WWF at some point in the future, which would be a disaster. It might be, but that doesn't mean that he thinks it will be, but you hit the nail on the head. The problem is, the Rock has the relationship with Nick Khan. Ari Emanuel, I'm going to guess he may not know the ins and outs of pro wrestling so well, but he knows The Rock is a star and he knows that his agency has represented him. Rock's the biggest wrestling star they can get to be a part of any of this stuff, and he needs it. He needs it more than they need it. Rock's right now not in the middle of a career resurgence or anything. His movies have been bombing. People don't want to see them. He destroyed DC. Everyone's been talking about that. I brought it up on the show a few weeks ago. Now we're seeing reports where people are saying, yeah, that's one of the reasons he's there. That's going on. His TV show, Canceled, was a terrible show. The thing with him and Oprah asking the common man to donate their money while they sat there <laughs> worth a whole lot more than them was ridiculous. It's one thing after another, after another, after another. So he comes back to wrestling when he needs it which in a way is kind of pathetic because there are people there every single day busting their ass for that company to try to do it. Well, but at the same time, this is not Bulldog Bob Brown booking himself in the main event in Kansas City. No, and this right? isn't even Hulk Hogan showing up at the end of WrestleMania 9 and taking the, the title from Yokozuna after he beat Bret Hart. It's not even, it's, it's not even Hogan in the, in the Georgia Dome when the tickets were already sold. No, this, this would be like if Hogan showed up at WrestleMania 10 in the Garden. And right before the match with Brett and Yokozuna, he took Brett's spot. That's what this would be like. And the backlash is coming because Dwayne Johnson built his career on being really fucking talented in the ring, really talented on the mic, a generational talker. If you think about that era of WWE, Steve Austin, The Rock, Vince McMahon, even yeah. The Undertaker's like a notch below that. He can't do that anymore. He doesn't have the chops. His promos have become cornier and cornier. No disrespect. Hey! They say now that he's going to bring Brian Gowertz back into the I fold with all say, this. Well, he's got old Gerwitz there, the only guy ever to lose a slap fight to Paul Heyman. Yeah, that's what you want. A little virgin whose material was shitty 15 years ago. He's now going to have a hand in the creative? Listen, I have not always been a big... Paul Levesque fan, and we don't know how tied up he is with all this Vince stuff. Paul Levesque should be running that company right now for the creative end without any interference because he's proven he could do it and he's doing well right now. Why fuck anything up in the middle of the hottest period ever? You know, they thought we'll turn Austin heel and have him go with McMahon. We're as hot as we can be. What could go wrong? Everything went wrong. And you're shoving the rock in a spot that the wrestling fans who live and die with wrestling don't want him in. You're not hearing any of those fans say, yeah, this is great. None of them. No, they're invested in Cody. Well, see, that's, that's why I'm saying I don't think that they, the non-wrestling people that are now in the picture understand because there is no parallel potentially in the UFC or probably even in Hollywood for the vehement disagreement that they will encounter from their main fan base with something like this in trying to oh the rock will we get five million people to watch peacock or when it's the fucking rock 
But they, but it may not. It, That's the other thing. Who knows if he'll draw an extra audience to Peacock for this? Well, and let's face it, it's going to look good regardless because there's more people that have Peacock, and there's going to just be more people to watch this just because it ain't going to cost them anything, and it's right there in the living room, right? It's not. It's harder to quantify anybody's the contribution in the way of pay per view buys or whatever anymore because of you know it's more accessible but this is bad news Tell here's me. the thing listen to me as good a job as triple h has been doing and i'm not arguing with you about that he has been and it's probably better on a day-to-day -day basis than the rock could ever do because he's not been in that fucking space he's probably better on a day-to-day -day basis than vince has been in a long time well yeah well and that and that's faint praise vince as we found out his mind started turning to fucking squash years ago but they also, Triple H has got to watch out because even if he's not involved or wasn't involved or or he's he and Stephanie have been trying to distance themselves from the the other side of the family or whatever the case, again, you've got Hollywood agents, deal makers, childhood friend of the rock. He's a fucking celebrity. In, in Triple H, in, in Triple H's defense, he's d done this job and done it well. But who are they? they? They may think, you know, still, it's the fucking guy's son-in-law. You know, maybe we ought to just break clean. You never know what they're going to think. They probably had, as I said earlier in the program, they've had enough contact with Triple H and been there and had numerous discussions. I'm sure to where they have a fairly a good level of confidence that nothing bad is going to come out about him per se, or they wouldn't have had him in this position this long, this high. But if it comes down to a pissing contest between the rock and triple H, they're going to probably do what the rock says. The rock says, cause he's the fucking rock. And they're looking at a movie star and a celebrity and they don't understand the intricacies and the nuances that go into some of this shit and anything from the best players don't always make the best coaches to, you know, he's, he, he may not have the golden touch on everything anymore, but you can't deny that these people would probably put more faith in what the rock says than even triple H because of the different levels of notoriety. I can't deny that. I think it's a sad fact. I think it's a sad reality. But The Rock has never shown an ability to book. The Rock's material has been incredibly lame. He's running on the fumes of what he once was. Because he comes out there with his Brian Gewirtz material and it bombs. It's lame. It's terrible. Remember Cena calling up for having wait, crib but, notes on his hand? Yes, but I never, I never see him bomb because people are just happy to see him there. He can fart in their general direction. They're going to moderately like it. Again, the surprise pop is a lot different than The Rock's going to be here next Monday. What's he going to say? There's a big difference there. They're doing everything they can to stack it so The Rock gets these moments. And the last thing wrestling fans want is well, WWE to be built around The Rock. But that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to stack these programs so everybody gets a big pop. It's just that uh, some people have a, a, a more pull than others to have that done. The problem is The Rock is a self-serving guy, and he's coming in here. Oh, now, come on now. It, I mean, if a self-serving person if he was just completely self-serving would well they would do things like nepotism like having their daughter become the general manager of her own <laughs> brand that's right even at the tender age of uh, early 20 something and the fact that she couldn't say suey if the hogs had her or there might be a renewed push for a talent that is related to the rock that was released months ago because there wasn't anything for her and suddenly she's just kicking everybody's ass. Well, there'd be something like that going on if there was anything untoward with this relationship. I have no doubt The Rock would love to run WWE and love to be the top star there, but it would be the wrong move in a hundred different ways. And what happens the next time he gets a big role? He's not going to drop wrestling like he always has? Well, wait, hold on here a second. If he just got $30 million to be on the board of directors, he's going to be in the main events of pay-per-views. He's going to goddamn, if he potentially was signed on to run this company and get X amount of stock, how many movie deals are that fucking good? 
Well, he announced he's doing Smashing Machine, the Mark Kerr movie. I haven't heard too many other. Again, The Rock has had well, a string of movies smashed. that have not done well. So I don't know what roles he currently has, but he keeps trying to get his own projects off the ground. They're all terrible. That well, show on HBO. How are your movies doing? I don't have any movies. I guarantee if I made a movie, it would be better than The Rock's. <laughs> Even if it made less money, it would be a better movie because he doesn't have the sensibilities. He doesn't understand. His TV show was a bomb. Wait, wait, the wait, XFL is a bomb. Wait, now, Tony Khan, even if it doesn't make 15 cents in Chinese money, it'd be better. It'd be more stars. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't have Dwayne Johnson in the film, but maybe that would help the film, actually, <laughs> now that I think about it. No, look, the fact of the matter is, I was a fan of The Rock in his day, and he was great. You go back and watch that stuff, the facial reactions, the timing, everything. Oh, yeah. He was great. I'm not taking any of that away. I'm saying... This is Hulk Hogan coming back. Not even WrestleMania 10. Imagine 10 years later. Well, 15 years later. He did, he did come back 10 years later. Well, against The Rock. And, and it worked. They started cheering Hogan. But this would be like a Hulk Hogan coming back when not needed. And people saying, well, he's a big star. We got to put him in a main event. It's akin to Hulk Hogan and WCW at times. Well, I, I guess the point I'm making is. And the talent can... isn't happy. You see the Logan Paul tree, uh, treat? What? Tweet? treat? It was a treat what he tweeted. <laughs> Well, yes, and that's it. Logan Paul tweeted, hashtag, we want Cody. Uh, we love Logan Paul, and he's a great talent. I mean, he just signed a contract. I'm sure they'll honor it, but it's probably not a good idea to get sideways with the fucking biggest member of the board of directors and the biggest star in a known universe uh, in his first week on the job. Well, first of all, they have a history, but second of all, you know, what's, what's The Rock going to do, fire him? Go ahead. That would be what is their history? I didn't, have they crossed paths? Yeah, I just saw this. So apparently years ago, when Logan Paul was just a kid making stuff on social media, his brother was a star on the Disney Channel already. He got to know The Rock a little bit. The Rock appeared in a few videos with him, a few photos with him. They got along. Logan Paul, and I think he even says it was a mistake, around that time went to Japan and I guess filmed people who had committed suicide. Oh, I heard about this story. And it cost him a lot. It cost him a, you know, a lot of his fan base. People were upset. Right around that period of time, he said that The Rock's PR person reached out and said, Dwayne wants you to remove every single thing you have up with you and him. Every <laughs> photo, every video, he wants it all gone. And he thought him and Dwayne were cool. He said a few years later, when he started doing the wrestling stuff, all of a sudden, Dwayne hit him up. Hey, Logan, what's going on? And he never responded. <laughs> he's like, fuck this guy. And this, you know, they got something interesting on their hands. Because if they go all the way with this and the fans reject it, it's going to be an interesting dynamic. I don't know if the fans... Let's look at it another way. Do you think the fans are going to get behind Cody versus Seth? <sighs> and then what do you do? Does Cody win that belt? Well, but uh, they, we already know Seth is hurt. Oh, and, well, and there's another thing, to be quite honest, uh, that I've missed when I talked about what they could do. I didn't mention is Cody's got to win that thing. And then the only reason he won that was so that he can unify it. So he can go in against Roman at some point, and unify the fucking belts that might help also, but we know Seth is hurt. I, I, you don't want him to risk further injury to have a blow away match, but else then it's going to be a letdown. That's why they were, you know, him and a heel, that could take advantage, it would work. But this is the opposite of that. It would, that's why my head is not on fire about it because I'm kind of understanding what each side is thinking in this. And it's nice problems to have. Gosh, should we have The Rock on our fucking show or not? But with the locker room, yes, because they're... Their money is guaranteed. WWE's money is guaranteed. Everybody just gets paid now like they've got a fucking job. It blows my mind in the wrestling business. And it's important to know, this may be the healthiest locker room they've ever had. Well, yes, that's the thing is that the, everybody gets the money regardless of whether what sells or what don't sell or pay-per-view or whatever. So now they're like, well, Cody's with us here. Every, he's, we love him, and he's here with us all the time, whereas The Rock is this star that comes in every so often, and we don't even know him, some of us. So they're going to be on Cody's side. If this was 40 years ago and it was the territories and you got paid on the house, they'd probably all be blowing the rock. Now, there are some people who think that if CM Punk hadn't gotten hurt, the road they were going with was Punk and Rollins 
Cody and Roman. There are other people that think that even if Punk didn't get hurt, The Rock was still going to do this. You have any thoughts on that? Um, if he was, this made it easier. And also, don't forget Lesnar. Because that's another thing. <sighs> Who was he going to they... work with? Was it him and Gunther? I, be- I heard it was going to be him and Gunther, which would have been, you know, just lovely for us. Prick. Now he's fucked that up. Um, every time I want to see one of these assholes that I don't like, just because I <laughs> begrudgingly admit they have talent, then they piss me off. Um, but again, to, to Nick Khan, to the upper echelon, losing a star, the level of Brock Lesnar and CM Punk at the same time, Seth Rollins is injured and probably not hundred percent. That just made it all the more easy for the rock to come in and say, well, look, I can, I can do my part, to save this whole thing. And he, and he probably believes that also. Cause I mean, you know, <laughs> He's the rock. He has self-confidence. He certainly so, does. So it's, again, you know, in years past, this would have been great problems to have. Well, we lost CM Punk, but we got the rock or whatever. But the way that they've got themselves into this thing with the most, again, with the most dedicated, regular, devoted fan base, the regular viewer, they wanted Cody to, to finish this thing. So that's going to be, I'd, I I was just going to say it remains to be seen how vehement they're going to get about this. I don't think that it will get to the level of Danielson 10 years ago just because times have changed and also this is the rock is a bigger personality. He's still going to have people on his side. If they make Cody go out there and endorse the rock and be his little buddy, that's not going to help any of this. Well, but I think th- the way that they tried to present this was Cody on an equal standing bringing the rock in to do something for him if it's followed up on that way then it helps but if it's and that's why I said Cody almost has to be the one to level the playing field for rock because it it, it it can't be rock doing something that everybody else has failed to do while presented with same set of circumstances I don't know what the upcoming schedule is. I don't have it in front of me. But if you are going to still do Roman versus Cody, a title change, do you try to hold it at Madison Square Garden to complete the story? Only if Madison Square Garden's a big premium live cock event. But see, that's the issue. WrestleMania is going to be the the scene. It's going to be the thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of people, the fireworks, the stadium. That's the place to do it. That's the problem people have. You don't want to see this on like some secondary pay-per-view. You want to see this story end at WrestleMania. Well, but how secondary is SummerSlam? It's not secondary. It's just six more months. Well, gonna... they might. No, it's not. Uh... Not after after WrestleMania, April, from now, May, June, July. It's the end of July, right? So three and a half. I was thinking from now, but I was also thinking well, August. But anyway. Eh, I don't know. You know... We'll see what happens. Do you change course? Do you? I mean, I know you can't predict what they'll do. Yes. If the reactions become something you can't hide, do you change course? Do you lean into it? Do you try to do anything differently? And what do you think about what I brought up earlier, the idea that Roman would defeat The Rock at WrestleMania? Well, see, that's why I said earlier, that's a... It's a big double whammy to not give the people Roman and Cody and then also Roman wins and beats The Rock even. It, would that be an Andre moment, an Andre and Sheik? we like, oh, fuck. At this point, nobody's ever going to do it. It turns them off. I d- <sighs> and also, again, you go with a triumphant return of a fucking major star of the past. But normally, this would have been... This would have been booked to where that you could get the new star to win the title and and stop the undefeated streak or the defense streak or whatever and then have the big star return for a double whammy rather than the big star comes back first. Who does it help more and which victory would help the company more, Cody or The Rock? Who does it help more and what would actually, in the long run, be the best thing for the company? Rock's 51. Well, you know, Cody's still yeah, in his prime. Yeah, no, Co- Cody is definitely the long-term. And 
it helps the company more that Cody wins the title and is the next champion than I can see than the rock who's who's bigger than the title to be honest at this point and also has already had it multiple times and they they would be wasting Roman Reigns' streak and and you know defenses to just have the rock win it. But again, yeah, you know, that seems champions, counterproductive. That to me, that's incredibly But champions in the past have lost non-title matches or lost falls in tag team matches, and it didn't take away the momentousness when they lost the actual belt. This is a different situation because of the way they built up the bloodline. I mean, he's held the title for all this time. Not that many defenses, like a Bruno or something, but right. man of days. The whole idea should be the first person that beats Roman Reigns gets elevated. It doesn't elevate the Rock at all. Well, and you asked, you know, if they start getting bad feedback, do they call an audible or do they switch directions? I can't anticipate. In Philadelphia, how's that crowd going to react? Well, but but at the same time, they're not all from Philadelphia. Most of them aren't. It's not like That's true. That's a good point. Here's here's fifty thousand fucking pissed off Philadelphians that you know cheered the hunter that shot Bambi's mother. No, they've come from everywhere but Philadelphia. And so I can't imagine them giving The Rock such a bad reception at the TV tapings leading up to this and or even at WrestleMania where the most, you know, dedicated WWF fans are going to be. I can imagine there being boos or dueling chants or whatever, but not like I, I were hooting you out of the fucking building, you prick. We wish you weren't here. I can't see that with The Rock. I'm sorry. Again, it's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out. Brian Gewirtz back involved with creative because of The Rock, <laughs> which would be so stupid. Nia Jax is all over this show again. His daughter, who, you know, may be a really nice person, but she's not an on-air character on a wrestling show. Yeah, when well, we're not maligning her as a person or, you know, saying she shouldn't do anything that makes her happy, but... It's it's a little obvious when just suddenly, you know, this she's been wrestling training for like a year and suddenly she's the general manager on camera of the promotion. It's uh, George Goulas was never the commissioner. Right? No, he's too busy going to bed or picking his go nose to, or picking his ass, go, whatever he did. Go to bed, Georgie. <laughs> um but yeah, you know, but that's the thing is uh, I'll I'll close with this. We'll close it up until next week when more shit will be revealed and we're reevaluating our opinion of everybody. I see the TKO executives going, you know what? We've got a good relationship with Triple H. Or he wouldn't have got that far and it and they've obviously been pleased with his business performance and I don't think he would have got this far without them knowing somewhat that he had some of what of a defensible clean bill of health. But if this gets bad enough with Vince, they may just, I mean, I would think Bruce would start, you know, heading down to the U-Haul place to buy boxes because he was so closely aligned with Vince. Stephanie's not there anymore and doesn't look like there's any plans for her to come back. Triple H is the only one from the Vince McMahon regime and company that you would think is pretty goddamn important to stay there for the benefit of the product and the talent roster and everything else. But if TKO makes a clean break and said, we don't want any more of that Vince McMahon fucking stench on us. How so are they going to do that? Ari Emanuel had to know this stuff about Vince McMahon and he made the, made him the executive chairman. He was asked about it in interviews, about all these things. Was he concerned? But, uh, you know, so for TKO to, to give someone like Triple H, just to use him as an example, a hit over this, they're going to get killed because, I mean, Dana White hit his wife on video. Well, yeah. He's still the head of the UFC. Vince McMahon had all sorts of allegations. They made him the executive chairman. They didn't have to buy WWE. In, in Hollywood, aren't these NDAs you know, fairly common, but it's, there's, there's nothing common about the details of this thing that's come out in any industry or line of work. 
And I'm just thinking that they didn't have any idea that this was the story. They thought it was, yeah, the movie producer, he's paying off the girls to whatever the fuck. But, you know, this is, I think, has probably caught a bunch of people with their thoughts unawares. We'll see. Ricochet has also tweeted out, we want Cody as a hashtag. <laughs> Hey, so, now I'll tell you, Logan Paul may have the balls and the fucking shoe size to say what he wants, but I don't know if if I was Ricochet, if I'd be pissing off the fucking Rock right now. Would you? You know what? The last thing the Rock needs is a locker room revolt against him. And the locker room is pretty united. I mean, everyone there's still factions and people still have issues with other people, but as I said before, maybe more than any other time in wrestling history, especially without Vince there, who always tried to create a dynamic that was tense for other people other than him. This locker room gets along. Yeah, he, he Vince liked having, because that was the old, the old-fashioned way that a lot of promoters did. Vince liked having his top guys kind of at odds with each other because it made them work harder and try to get over each other, which made shows and business better. But like I said, now it doesn't matter. And the guys don't care who's on the card. They don't care what it draws because they're always getting the same amount of money. And I killed Cody years ago when he was trying to be something he wasn't. And I killed him when his booking in AEW didn't make any sense and was counterproductive. And again, he was trying to be something he isn't. And since he returned to WWE, he has found who he is. And yeah. the fans accepted him. In AEW, the fans didn't accept him. Here they do. Not only do they accept him, his popularity has only grown. He absolutely deserves the, not deserves, I mean, it's wrestling. He should be in the main event of WrestleMania against Roman Reigns to finish the story, yeah. to complete the booking in the right way, for a number of reasons. He deserves it, he's earned it, and he's proven himself. And it's tough for a guy just to slide back in and take all that away. If this was an Agatha Christie novel and they're just about ready to name the killer and suddenly they introduce a new character, wouldn't it throw you fucking off? Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. We didn't think about him. He was the gardener in the boathouse. What? Nobody's mentioned him in the first 240 pages. Well, he just got here. Man, with Punk being injured, you get Cody the belt and you get him into a feud with Gunther. And it would be amazing. It would be great. But instead... You know, it's going to be interesting, too. How much is The Rock going to be on TV? Is The Rock going to be at every Raw? Is The Rock going to be at SmackDown? And how much is he going to be around before and after WrestleMania on TV? Because you can't have him beat Roman if he's not going to be around even as little as Roman's around. So that's another question. Cody's there every week. Well, and that's why I say they get this match, but there has to be heavy involvement from Cody in a momentum changing way or a, a point of making a difference in some respect to where that Cody and the rock are presented more as bruiser and crusher than, you know, fucking Andre and Mike Pappas. I know how Cody can get the match back. The rock comes out on raw, gets in the ring, you know, quiet, not quiet, but he doesn't say anything. Let's the crowd get going. And then right before he's about to talk, you hear from the back, who told you this was open mic night, bitch? <laughs> Randy hits the ring and demands her man gets a title shot. I've come up with multiple options over the last two years to get Brandy on this show. <laughs> and it always starts with it's open mic night, bitch. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if open mic night's ever coming to the WWE. I don't think so, but it's going to be interesting how this plays out and how the fan reaction goes because, you know, it's almost like an activist fan base nowadays. There's not a passive fan base just waiting to see what happens. They want to make what happen. They want to make things happen that they want to happen, especially when they're led to believe it's going to happen. But think about this. If somebody a year ago had said, well, a year from now, the same company is going to own the WWE and the UFC. Vince McMahon is going to have been run off in shame for fucking sexual deviances, the likes of which we haven't seen since the days of ancient Rome. And the fans are going to be pissed off because The Rock came back. What would you have said? I would have said, uh... <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you know what? We've had so many twists and turns and surprises over just the last few months. I don't know what's going to happen next. Uh, 
I go, well, I know what's going to happen next. Your show, right? Oh, no. Yes, the drive through Next. Yes, because this has been mine, and it's over, and now yours is coming up next in a few days. Or you can, if you want to out there in podcast land, you can listen to the last podcast that was still Brian's show, just the last one we did a few days ago. Or you can come back next week and listen to more of this one. That's right. We will be or here. Just err on the side of safety and listen to everything. Who knows well, what's what going to happen? Or what if next week we have a big show? Like it's going to be the Brian and Jim special, like a big celebration, a big show. But I don't show up. Alice Radley instead gets plugged into the spot. That's the rock coming back. That's what no, this no, 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 no. I would the be Alice fearing, Radley of wrestling. <laughs> I would be fearing for my life if that scenario you just <laughs> described happened. I don't think anybody's going to be that pissed off about The Rock, but there would definitely be some villagers with pitchforks. Yes, they would. Well, anyway, we're all coming back next week on The Experience. Keep watching the wrestling news and watching the skies because you never know what's going to fall on you next. And until then, Thank you, fuck you, and bye-bye, everybody.